What's going on, everyone? I'm Vinny Costa, editor of Street Muscle Magazine and your host of the Rodcast, brought to you by Lucas Oil. Today, I'm joined by my co-host, Greg Costa, editor of Engine Labs and the all-around tech guru. What's up, Greg? Hey, Vinny. How you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. Uh, ready to get to the next episode in a um, anticipated series out of the way, right? So, um, yeah. you know, if people have clicked on it, then they know what car we're going to build. I'm excited to... Uh, to knock out this Audi and see where it stacks up against the fabled Corvette C8. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, man, we're going into it with the, the I, a little bit of let down, right? I mean, is that fair? Is that a fair way to put it? I mean, I won't say I was let down. I just was like, I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head the last time we talked and that's that, you know, we perhaps built it up a little bit too yeah. much. Right. Or, or maybe Chevy's marketing was just like super good on the C8 and it had us thinking that, oh man, this, is, this was a, a supercar killer. But uh, I don't know. It remains to be seen. That's why I'm eager to get into today's episode and see like, yeah. maybe, we're, maybe we're wrong and like it is. Or maybe the super muscle cars are just that good. I'm, I, that's what I'm leaning towards, man. Like, I think that's what kind of killed it for us, right? We had built these, these, high horsepower monsters that are just crushing it on the track. And then we build the C8 and we're expecting the same thing, but we had just got done building a Hellcat, a ZL1 and a GT500. So it's like, yeah. Well, the thing is, man, none of those are supposed to handle. They're supposed to be like these brutish, you know, ill-mannered straight line speed cars. And that's not the case anymore. It's not not 2005. You know what I mean? It's, they've come a long way. Um, So, I guess that's what we should be more surprised about. The fact that those can handle so well, not the fact that a base model Corvette is not as, you know, powerful. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and again, by no objective means is the C8 bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, what world are we living in where one G on the skid pad gets scoffed at, you know, yeah. like, I, I, yeah, I, uh, I think I think maybe we're looking at it through some some rose colored glasses. So yours would be like, you guys are spoiled. This is ridiculous. Can you can you imagine somebody from the seventies like listening to us now? It's an like, embarrassment of riches, is what it is, man. One hundred and ten percent. We just have amazing cars to pick from now, and uh, and let's uh, let's show them another one today. Yeah. Like, the, the um, Audi R8. Um, I guess uh, let's just jump right into it, man. You know, we've got Rob waiting for us in the waiting room. So uh, before we get there, let's uh, take a quick word from one of our sponsors. At Silver Sport Transmissions, we believe classic cars and trucks look their best on the open road, and four wheel drives belong on the trail. We continue to innovate and develop the best overdrive transmission packages for muscle cars, street rods, classic trucks, and four-wheel drive vehicles. Our commitment to customer service and integrity is second to none. When the wrenches begin to turn, Silver Sport Transmissions is there. Hit the trail with Silver Sport Transmissions. And we're back. Greg Acosta and Rob Finkelman and myself. Vinny Costa. What's going on, gentlemen? Doing good, guys. Good to see you. It's been Thank you, Rob. Welcome good. back. Yeah, it's been like two weeks. We were going to do a, uh, a Rodcast last week, but unfortunately, they're tearing up my driveway. And the day we were scheduled to do it, I had jackhammers going off literally right outside my front door. And, and it was so loud, there would be no way we would have gotten a clean recording. So... Such is the nature of what yep. we do. Yeah, but so hey, we were building we're anticipation now. is what we were doing. <laughs> What's that? We were building anticipation is what we were doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You always got to leave them wanting more. You know, exactly. that's the sacred rule of uh, of Hollywood and storytelling. So, Greg, uh, refresh our memories and for the audience. Um, what? Uh, where did we leave off last? Uh, uh, last time we did the C eight. And it came in uh, pretty decent scoring. I mean, I think it's going to be hard to beat on the spreadsheet, but I think all of our opinions were a little disappointed. Yeah. Uh, I think we had a little bit uh, built up a little bit more 
in our heads. Well, you know, I reflected on it since, and and there's an interesting component to it. All of us seem to be going into that under the impression that the Corvette was really a world beater car now. That it had it that it was redesigned as a mid-engine car, and I realized that Chevrolet was extremely clever in their marketing of the car, because as we discovered last time, it really isn't a world beater car. In fact, we found out that a Shelby GT500 navigated the Nurburgring quicker than the Corvette did, which we were all shocked about given the yeah. fact that the GT500 is front engine, it's a lot taller and higher center of gravity than the VET. Well, is it? Is it I'm sorry, go that? ahead. Bro. Sorry, go well, ahead. I was just gonna say, you know, Chevy like brainwashed us and the way they did it was they highlighted the fact that the C8 can scoot to 60 miles an hour in under three seconds. And that was the big banner, the bullet, you know, in their advertising and stuff. And you just see that and you say to yourself, geez, to get a sub three second car, uh, you know, in the zero to 60 run, you used to have to spend several hundred thousand dollars for a Ferrari or, or a McLaren or a Lamborghini. Now that I'm thinking back on it, did the, was the Corvette released? before or after like the gt500 and some of those other cars because if it was before uh, then maybe that's why we're thinking like oh yeah this is like this world beating car but since I'm then not, these other cars have come out i think it was pretty much concurrent with the gt500 in particular as they switched you know um as they uh did away with the gt350 and made the gt500 the lone uh shelby offering well, and i do remember that when when they first came out there was a lot of comparison and everybody kind of had to st stop and take a step back and go why are we comparing a mustang to a corvette right. when did this happen like wait right. this how did right. this happen yeah. yeah and now we see oh well that's actually a fair comparison but think of how effective the media campaign is in just subliminally convincing us that the corvette was this world beater when it really didn't handle that well, according to the numbers we were looking at. Uh, the quarter mile times, I mean, it's a fast car, but hell, I mean, uh, a Hellcat Red Eye and a GT500 hang, a GT500 beats it, a Hellcat Red Eye hangs with it. Mm -hmm. um, and so Chevy very cleverly, I guess through gearing, I mean, Greg is the tech, right. I mean, that's what I think. I I haven't torn it, you know, really yeah. torn up our specs, but it looks like they they robbed they, Peter to pay Paul to get that spec. Yeah, they probably geared it to get that spec and ran with that spec in their in their advertisements, and it led you to believe, well, if this car can do a sub three second zero to sixty, it must be a a, a nine second quarter mile car or a low ten second quarter mile car, and it's not. So yeah, well, we were and, all kind of nonplussed, I think is and the you best know what? For it. If they did that, if they really did hinge all that on that zero to 60 time, bravo, it worked. Exactly, like, it's brilliant. Bravo. That's my point, Greg. It's <laughs> like they fooled us all, you know? It would be the like the only good thing that GM marketing has done <laughs> in the past <laughs> yeah. couple Ouch. years. Ouch, and this is coming from the guy with a, a garage full of Chevys. I yeah. am, I'm, I'm a bow tie guy. I love, I love yeah. what they do, what they make, but let's be honest, you know, Dodge is like the king of marketing and Ford does it a little bit better than Chevy. It's just yeah. what it is. Well, let's all let's add a caveat. We all know that a Z06 is coming soon. Yeah. And after that, hopefully we'll be graced with a ZR1. And um, I can pretty much guarantee you the Z06, which is designed to be a, a, a handling car. It's not so much of a like a power monster over what the base C8 is. Uh, will handle a lot better. You'll probably see vastly improved Nurburgring times and skid bad um, numbers and stuff like that. And when the ZR1 comes around, if and when, it'll combine massive power with the Z06's handling. So sometime in the future, I, I'd say we got to revisit a Corvette because we will eventually have a world contender 
car on well the 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 z06 has been you know teased as having a flat plane crank correct you know engine so i mean they're you don't just throw a flat plane crank in an engine and call it a day right like you're not going to go through that level of production change for 10 horsepower right so no, it's gonna so have this, something but yeah, yeah historically for sure i mean you look at uh like even like the c5 that you know the factory ls that was in there made what um like 400 like just over 400 and then the z06 version made 505 so quite a right. bump but not you know astronomical yeah right so we'll, i mean we'll, in terms of power we'll have to wait and see on a zr1 and guys I mean, would any of you at this point, given the move manufacturers are making towards electric, uh, discount the idea that the ZR1 will have uh, uh, electric uh, motors, you know, in, in addition to the ICE in some capacity? You mean kind of like the RSX? Or, or RSX, like the, the NSX? Uh, NSX, yeah. 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 No, exactly. I mean, honestly, I can't discount that. Absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know, you know, if that's more in Greg's wheelhouse, but um, I, part of me thinks like, I hope not just because, uh, you know, I want the last Corvette, like internal combustion engine Corvette to be just that, you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. Well, he here's the thing, uh, the hybrid, the whole hybrid thing. I know a lot of people can't stand it. Have you watched a Formula One race lately? Like, it's still got the sounds. Oh, it's, like, it's, it's still a, it's still there. Like, yeah, you can hear a couple, a little bit of motor whine every now and then. Yeah, and it's but, insanity tech, technology-wise. Formula One engines right now are 1.5 liters, and the cars are in excess of a thousand horsepower. They're they're putting out some of them. Like Mercedes is probably putting out close to 1,100 horsepower out of a 1.5 liter hybrid assisted engine. You can't do that with an ice. It well, would just be impossible. Well, that, that's not ice. totally fair to Mercedes, I think, to give that all to the, to the electric technology because a couple of years ago, I, I wanna say 18, I wrote an article on it, so I think it was 18. Mm -hmm. um, they got their internal combustion engine to break the 50% efficient thermal efficiency barrier. Yes, that's correct. And that that in and of itself is amazing. So I mean they're, astonishing. Yeah, they're they're not just relying on those electric motors no. to pick up the slack. It's having said that, the, the like you know, Mercedes having pretty much the premier uh formula one engine right now i know they and formula one is very secretive with their technology yeah. the teams don't reveal horsepower numbers and stuff like that but uh, people who are clever use gps and stuff like that to analyze yeah. um like straight line speed and they can estimate pretty closely what the cars are putting out i think the mercedes ice right now just the ice itself from 1.5 liters, they're churning out 700 horsepower just I, from the- that's, that's very easily believable. Yeah. Because if you, if you work there's... backwards on the on the size and you know the efficiency, right. that's not any, it's not like the, the C8 Corvette coming out where everybody was like, those numbers don't make sense. Right, the, right. Th those numbers do make sense. And that's right. totally and, believable. And, it, and then it's, it's boosted by uh, a kinetic energy recovery system, which reclaims um, energy from yeah. braking. And it has a thermal uh, regenerative unit called a, 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 a what is it called? Uh, M MKUH, which somehow harvests. Yeah. The exhaust of the turbochargers and converts yeah. it back into electric energy. It, it basically, if if it's still the same technology that it was back in eighteen, which I think it is. Yes, it's it basically is. an electric generator, not a motor, but a generator between the compressor and the exhaust. Housing. Correct. That's exactly. So it just, right. I mean, it, it's it is one of the coolest technologies I've ever seen. It is. I'm not big it's on hybrids, but damn, that's cool. And, and you were, you mentioned thermal efficiency in no other field of technology right now in the entire world has anyone else reached over 50% thermal efficiency, not NASA, not nowhere, literally yeah. formula one is the cutting edge for efficiency in, uh, well, and, and if they were willing to release all the data they released in 18, where are they, where were they really at then? And where are they at now? 
well, you won't know for 10 years from yeah. now when they say, gee, our 2021 car was actually putting out 1200 horsepower. Yeah. And, Gentlemen, uh, as much as I like hearing you guys uh, nerd out <laughs> over um, thermal uh, efficiency technology, uh, the people want to know what car we're going to build today. Yes. And they want us to stop uh, speculating about whatever Corvette comes next. Yeah. They don't want to hear us talk about what Corvette could possibly come next. Right. Well, in fact, we're we're doing a German car today. Das ist gut. Das ist gut. <laughs> and uh, the, I believe the only commercially available mid-engined uh, supercar that you can get out of Germany right now is the car that we're going to do, which is the Audi R8, um, awesome. which many people describe as one of the best handling and performing cars in the world. And for those who don't know, the underpinnings of the R8 are identical to what is in the Lamborghini Huracan because Audi owns Lamborghini right now. And uh, the drivetrain is pretty much exactly the same. Now, now, how does that work? Is it is is VAG like the, the parent company and they're each, or is it more tiered? Like, does Audi own Lamborghini? Does VAG just owner uh by, by the way i'm not being vulgar uh that's <laughs> that's VAG. Yeah, volkswagen audi group is oh, audi group okay to, right yeah uh uh i believe i mean the parent company really is volkswagen which owns audi and lamborghini and uh the huracan and the r8 share a platform and they share a drivetrain so it's uh in the v10 version of the r8 it is the same v10 uh slightly detuned in the r8 from the huracan but it's, so, it's the same block and the same so this is almost like a like a two for one episode for the people yeah around. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when it well, when it comes to the engine, I mean, you go to any of those, you know, underground racing or any of those Lamborghini tuning shops, you see Lamborghini slash R8. So there you go. I mean, it's it's all the same stuff to them. How come Lamborghini owners always melt their bumpers? Uh, I've seen a lot uh, of videos of like Lamborghini. Honestly, honestly anti lag kits, mm. popping and banging and dumping fuel in the exhaust and pulling, you know, pulling timing so it goes bang, 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 pop, pop. pop. Or what I about just, stupid I just, I just slap want on? What about stupid slap on turbochargers? That's always good for for fun when those overheat and you know. Well, you know when you when you've got a Lamborghini, it's only the best from eBay. You mm. know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. True. Uh, I'm, actually, that's I'm good glad question, that we're doing, Vinny. That's What's good that? question. I said that's a good question, uh, and I think Greg's probably sufficiently answered as to why. <laughs> you know lamborghinis I, uh, suffer I, I like did, that. i jest really but um i uh i'm actually glad that we're doing the audi instead of doing the lamborghini and we talked about this a little bit um last episode and the reason that we're not doing a lamborghini is because um we're trying to do kind of like a corvette versus the world and italy is being represented by ferrari of course uh it would only be right and so mm. you know not really a need for two contenders so i'm glad that we kind of get to see a little bit but also mm -hmm. you know represent a different country yeah i mean it was a hard choice because when you think of ultra high performance cars the name lamborghini is always in there but the truth of the matter is that there is no other brand in the world that represents an entire country like ferrari does to italy it is literally the uh, the passion behind Ferrari in Italy in both motorsports and street cars is unparalleled in the in the entire world. And, uh, you know, if you think of Japan, well, they have multiple brands, you know, Toyota, Honda, which one is the national brand? Well, there isn't one. Uh, America has the big three uh, and Tesla, which is the American brand, there isn't one, but in Italy, there is, and it's Ferrari. And if we were going to pick one car per country, it has to be a Ferrari, which meant yeah. we had to leave out Lamborghini. And you're right, this is a great way to kind of get Lamborghini into the mix. Uh, I because really the R8, get, I really want to get into building the R8, but I also want to go down a couple rabbit holes with you, real quick, Rob. Sure. Um, now that we're talking about that, uh, you know, we're talking, a little, you were talking a little bit about Ferrari. Um, it just, 
you were talking about, you know, kind of like um, a national representative uh, as far as um, automakers are concerned. It made me think of that movie Ford versus Ferrari, which of course you did a review on. Um, mm -hmm. Refresh my memory. What was your take on the accuracy of the film and how Ferrari was represented? Uh, it was excellent, uh, you know, in every Hollywood uh, depiction of a true life story, there's always going to be a corners cut for the sake of, of dramatic structure. And sometimes they hype up rivalries because all drama in movies comes from characters not liking each other. Um, a perfect example of that, if, if y'all out there saw the wonderful Ron Howard movie, Rush, about the rivalry between Nicky Lauda and James Hunt in Formula One in 1976, they make them out to be bitter rivals. In, in fact, James Hunt and Nicky Lauda were extremely close friends and never took their sporting rivalry, rivalry off the track. They would take vacations together and stuff. Hmm. They were real tight friends. So there's an element of, of that kind of BS in, um, in Ford versus Ferrari. But in terms of the crux of what really happened versus what you saw in the movie in terms of the origins of the story, why Ford decided to try and beat Ferrari at Le Mans, it was very, very accurate. And it stemmed from a, a deal that fell through where Henry Ford, uh, the second, I believe, uh, or maybe it was the original Henry Ford, I'm not even sure, but whoever was running Ford at the time was in negotiations uh, to purchase Ferrari as a halo brand. It would be owned by Ford. Uh, Ferrari would have pretty much independent control over design and, and things like that. And the deal fell through close to like the last minute and it was Enzo Ferrari's doing that made the deal fell through. And the forces at Ford were aggrieved because they had spent millions of dollars on lawyers' fees and this and that. And they thought we're gonna have the most hallowed brand of car in the world under our corporate umbrella. And when it fell through, they just, they were pissed. And that led to the decision, well, screw Enzo, we're going we're gonna to beat him at his own game. And his own game at the time were in uh, two areas. It was Formula One and Le Mans. And first they beat him in Le Mans, and then they be actually beat him in Formula One as well. So, Man, can you imagine? Yep. If we would have never had the GT40. All, um, all I'm saying is anger is a powerful emotion. It anger is. Anger and the desire for revenge. It yeah. is. It's true. Um, well, in the interest of circling back, uh, we get to um, build another car that represents uh, the, the the German uh, side of uh, Europe. And um, I'm excited about it, man. Uh, it'll be pretty cool. I don't know too much about um, Audi's history, so I'm going to lean on you a little bit, Rob. Uh, hopefully yeah. you know uh, about, um, you know, Audi and the whole yeah, yeah, Audi actually is one of the older car companies in the world. It's not as old as Mercedes, which is the single oldest uh, continuous car manufacturer in the world. But Audi was formed out of four different automakers, German automakers pre-war. Uh, the biggest one was known as Auto Union uh, and three other lesser companies combined to form Audi. And it's interesting to note that the Audi symbol that most of us out there are familiar with, the four uh, interlocking rings, those four rings represent the original four companies that became Do you Audi. remember the names of those companies? Oh, you know, not right now. I had some drinks last night. So <laughs> <laughs> my brain isn't firing on it's all, all good. cylinders, but... Um, well, you know, speaking, the main speaking of Audi and cylinders, I recently yeah. just posted a five cylinder article, right? And the video that I, that I sourced left out the Audi five cylinder and mm. I forgot to bring it up Ooh. and oh Ouch. man, like I'm not even number? talking about like, oh, wow. People came back and, and said something. The fact that I forgot Audi's four cylinder, mm. or, I'm sorry, oh, five cylinder, five cylinder. I'm, I'm going to be doing its own article just to make up for it but i feel good so for you bad. 
because <laughs> Audi really is the company that perfected and and was the only company offering five cylinder cars for a while. Yeah, so. and they they so they're a little bit on the list. Yeah. What? So, oh yeah. So after the okay, so they've been around for a long time. Uh, they have a, a rich history. Uh, kind of give us the the cliff notes on how we got to here making insane performance cars. Uh, well, Audi, its origins, uh, like Auto Union ran in the progenitor, the, the precursor, uh, rather, of Formula One, which was just sort of um, an umbrella called Grand Prix racing in Europe. And Grand Prix racing went on uh, before World War II. Uh, it started in places like Monaco and how Hallow- We're talking about like open wheel, like Monaco. Coke. Yeah, like torpedo shaped yeah. cars that had open wheels. It was just right. called Grand Prix racing. Uh, and there weren't really a, a lot of rules behind it. Like if you wanted your super car deadly, to have, right? What's that? It was like super dangerous. Oh, super deadly. They were running on like tires like this, but they they had like 400 horsepower engines in these. I cars. always imagine like the guy with the goggles and the scar. Yeah, exactly. And and they didn't wear helmets. There were no such thing as seat belts in those days. It was pretty ludicrous. And these guys would be, you know, driving you know, with steering wheels that were like two and a half feet in diameter. And uh, oops. Sorry, guys. Let me. Uh, yeah, I always. Um, like uh, imagine those guys with like uh like the upturned mustache and yeah. then, then you're thinking mario that. kart mario oh, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> like well, a lot like of the a the lot of the original motorcycle. grand prix drivers were actually came out they were aviators in world war one and yeah, that's why crazy. one's crazy yeah. enough to do it <laughs> and and that's why the fashion of goggles and like a white scarf and that comes directly from aviation and that's those cool days. And um, so Auto Union had a rich history in racing. Um, and But when these companies came together to form Audi, they originally were really not a performance-based uh, company. Their focus uh, in terms of street cars was to produce highly reliable, um, mostly sedans, um, for the everyman. And that's what they were producing post-war as Germany you know, built itself up from the ashes after World War II. And their main competitors were what they are today. It was Mercedes and it was BMW, who were also, all three were building cars in the 50s and, and 60s. And it really wasn't until the 70s when rallying uh, you know, racing in the form of rallying became uh, a very popular sport that Audi became focused on high performance. They entered uh, rally racing with one of the most groundbreaking cars in history, which was known as the Audi Quattro, which had a very sophisticated four-wheel drive system. And it was the first time that anybody was successfully mated a full-time for or a, um, a differential locking four four-wheel drive system on anything smaller than like a military vehicle. And what time? And, what time frame was this? Seventies, uh, okay. mid seventies. They came out with the uh, Audi Quattro, and because of their ingenuity at Audi. Uh, they revolutionized rally racing. Like they just dominated with the Quattro and all the other big rally companies like Lancia, um, Peugeot, Renault, all the traditional companies that, that, that produce rally cars had to play catch up and had to devise their own, you know, four wheel drive systems before well, they, that. They there created was no such Group thing. B, right? I mean, well, Groupie was because, madness. Groupie, but I mean, that was that was because they were they were able to get so technologically advanced correct. that it was nothing to kill a human being. Correct, <laughs> like it was, correct. But Groupie was a specific uh, category of rallying in the '80s, in which, uh, for some ungodly reason, the authorities that 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 were decided there would be no cap on horsepower or anything it was the formula one of rallying where where you throw your money at it you can build whatever you want 
and horsepower started climbing into the like the 700 800 horsepower range and so it wasn't it, just like a unlimited class of racing within one mo particular motorsport it was like that motorsport was unlimited it, it well it was it in was the class, format yeah. of rallying it wasn't okay. traditional racing where you had like everybody you know racing it, against each other it was not time to trials in, not but, to go an even further rabbit hole but um it sounds like uh from what you guys are describing rallying itself was um you know originated in europe uh mm -hmm. and um all i mean all the the automakers that you mentioned were european you know renault and um you know audi and whatnot um, at what point did, you know, um, you know, American manufacturers and Japanese, uh, automakers start becoming involved with this? Um, mostly in the eighties, Subaru in particular got very interested in rallying Mitsubishi got very interested in rallying and it became so popular in part because of group B, which just to finish that subject real quick, group B was an unlimited category of rallying horsepower got way out of control. And of course, drivers started dying left and right. And what was worse, if you've ever seen rallying footage, um, spectators line the, the roads and sometimes gravel or snow uh, trails that the cars are running on. Cars were going off the track and killing spectators. And finally, the FIA, which was the governing body of all European motorsports, pulled the plug on Group B. But what happened was Group B was such madness that it really took rallying as a form of racing to a new level. And people really want, were, who were really into the sport wanted a rally car of their own. And so manufacturers like Mitsubishi and, um, and uh, Subaru and stuff started offering cars that we're all familiar with, like the WRX, which still exists today, the Mitsubishi Evo, which is no longer produced. Those are cars derived directly from rallying experience. Or homologation vehicles. What about... Uh, uh, and... Uh, and more pertinent to our conversation right now, Audi produced a Quattro streetcar. And it was heralded in the 80s as one of the best cars made. I would um, I would still own one if I could if I could get one today. Like yeah, just, they're just, quite expensive now and they're hard to find. Just because um, you know, I, I run Street Muscle and I would be remiss if I didn't ask about an American auto manufacturer. How long until the escort was introduced to, to rallying? That oh, was, was in, in the, the 80s. 70s as well. No, they were, okay. they were running in the 70s, weren't they? Ford with the, with the Capri? Yeah, but that was Ford Britain. That that was slightly different. The Capri oh, wasn't an American designed car. It was the British subsidiary of, of Ford that ran Capris. And uh there was another model they ran as well. I can't remember, but the like the escorts the that escort was a, a really of, big Rally was in the 80s, mid yeah. to late 80s. Like the Cosworth. Oh, yeah. Cosworths. Yeah, exactly. So uh, Audi was, really was the progenitor of four wheel drive rally technology. And then also the first company to bring it to the streets in the form of their Quattro streetcar. And from that point on, Audi became synonymous with performance. And they had also, we should mention, uh, partnered up with Porsche. Um, and back in the 70s, Volkswagen, Porsche, and Audi were one company. Porsche is now uh, somewhat uh, autonomous. But um, in, the, uh, in the early 2000s, when four-wheel drive and hypercars became synonymous as Lamborghini started building four-wheel drive hypercars, um, uh, Audi decided they wanted a halo car and their version of the halo car is what we're about to build. It was the Audi R8. I think it was first released in like 2004. I could be wrong. Maybe really? a little later. The R8 goes back that far? What's it? it might be later, like 2008. 2000 yeah, I'm thinking it came maybe. out a little bit later. I okay, remember. it could be. I, I don't profess out. to be an expert no, I, I hear you, but I, I think it did come out around 07, 08. It would have been around the time 06. I graduated high school. Oh, okay. okay. So let's split okay. the difference. <laughs> split the difference. And uh, it was an astonishing car when it came out. First of all, it was mid-engined. 
uh, and previous uh, to the R8, really mid-engine, you had to go to Italy to buy a car. And also it was a V10, uh, which was astonishing because uh, I believe Lamborghini was the only company in the world offering a V10 until the Lexus LFA came around and, or, well, Dodge had the Viper. I'm, I'm a little mistaken, but. The, uh, I remember when it came out, um, the marketing around it was really cool too, because it was uh, released in the first Iron Man movie that they did. Right. And yep. I remember seeing it, I was like, that's a wild looking car. It is wild. And it's a car that when we get to rating the aesthetics of, it's not a car that you can call beautiful, but it's certainly a car you can appreciate as being unique looking. Nothing else on the road looks like an R8. Definitely. And uh, so it was a really radical car. And to this day is, is, is really at the cutting edge of all sorts of technologies, engine technologies, four wheel drive technologies. Or are they on like the, like the third generation now or second? second. I think they're still in the second. Okay. Second. Yeah. Because they haven't been making a bunch of sweeping changes to it. Right. right. Um, I always get confused too, because the BMW i8, uh, they share, you know, they're almost the same. Um, and then obviously they have like a similar kind of shape uh yeah uh i8 is more of a like a wedge-shaped hypercar look whereas the r8 has a very distinct silhouette and profile that definitely i, I feel cool. like audi likes to retain curves as opposed to straight lines yeah. like yes. where lamborghini and is the angular stealth fighter correct where, and audi likes to retain... yeah, i think it would be difficult to put the audi emblem on anything that was like that angular right because it's just... yeah and and i mean one look at any sci-fi movie one interesting thing about audi when when those companies merge like auto union and the others to form audi one of the leading uh uh design uh uh uh, uh, movements in Germany at the time was the Bauhaus movement, which was really um, fascinated with combining planes with arches. Um, and I think the R8 that you see today, again, I don't claim to be an expert, but it does have clearly Bauhaus uh, touches to the design. And that's probably an homage to, um, you know, to the origins of the company. It's probably done quite, quite intentionally. And Audi also does it uh, in uh, another car uh, in their lineup as well, the uh, TT. Oh, yeah. uh, well, the, the TT. Is, well, the TT was literally so round. just an arch. Yeah, yeah well, it, it is a Bauhaus design, the TT, yeah. for sure. Well, the TT was so round. It was, the, it was, it was it's basically a wing. Like the car itself is a wing. Mm -hmm. And the first uh, first gen in the U.S., they didn't think it would go over like 140 because you can't do it legally. Right. And they realized the cars were coming up off the ground Yeah, because they're a wing. Yeah, so they had to do a recall and put, put little spoilers on the back of all of them. But right. their, their reasoning was, oh, there's nowhere in America to go that fast legally. We don't have to worry about it. They no, knew it was a problem. But guys find ways. <laughs> so, hey, yeah. listen, can we can we get into the build? Absolutely. Yes. If you'd stop asking me questions, we could have <laughs> built this thing already. Well, I, I felt like, you know, uh, <laughs> the, the Audi people would be kind of upset with us if we didn't go over the history. No, and, and, and all kidding aside, yeah, I think it's important in this series, just like we discussed aspects of the Corvette in terms of Duntov's uh, original desire to have the Corvette be a mid-engine car. It, it's equally as important to talk about the history of of Audi, so it's time well spent, but it's also time to get to the building, right? Well said, Greg. Okay. You want to hook us up? There we go. All right. So let's get into. Obviously, we're doing a coupe. I actually, I shouldn't say obviously. It, it's, it's yes, yeah. Okay. There's no reason to ever ask that question again. <laughs> okay, just making sure. Just right. making sure. All right. So let's. What does this configurator look like? Build your own. There we go. A legendary sports car to own. Period. All right. So, rear wheel drive or quattro? Ooh, that price already. Sheesh. You, well, you got to go with the quattro uh, technology, even though it bumps the price up. Oh, well, he, here's here's a question. In this, uh, I guess, level of buying a car, 
do people still pinch pennies? And obviously pinching pennies means you're pinching, you know, your t- sacks of $10,000 bills. But- right. My, my thought is it, it's interesting. Audi only offers one. It's not a halo car company. So they only offer one halo car, much like Chevrolet only offers the Corvette as their halo car. If you were to look at the Audi r eights competitors in the form of Ferrari, which is a halo company, where everything they build is super expensive and super fast. I think what happens is in the case of Ferrari, if you're looking to pinch pennies, you just buy the entry level model. Um, but if, if you're going full tilt boogie, you're going you're gonna to go for one of the higher end models. With an Audi, you only have one car to choose from. So the answer to that, in my opinion, was no one buys the rear wheel drive. R8. I, okay. I would imagine if you're already into a car for $142,000, an extra 50 is like. We're already um, 100 grand more than the vet we built. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, we're more than we, we're 110 grand over. I mean, wait till we get to the Ferrari and the McLaren boys if you want to talk expensive. Ooh, Let's look at it. look at what the it, it's not just the drive no, it's system. Not. It's the it, full performance package. It gives you about 70 extra horsepower, ceramic brake standard, uh, a lot of carbon fiber. And oh, you uh, like that, Greg. Some, yeah, you get some arrow, you get a front splitter, you get a better wing. Um yeah. You get racing, a, a, what does it say? And, racing shell seats in fine yeah. napa leather Ooh. and a dual clutch transmission to make uh, greg happy <laughs> and quattro all-wheel drive and audi as we've just gotten finished talking about makes the highest tech four-wheel drive systems in the world so state of the art there so can i make ooh, look a, at all these colors can i make a comment right now on color well yeah yeah, yeah, but since we've mentioned Formula One a lot today in the past as well, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but there's a reason why uh, Ferraris are co- so common uh, in red, why Jaguars are and and British cars are often in green. It's because of Formula One um, back in the Grand Prix era that predated Formula One, and in Formula One, it used to be. That ever the 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 team the country that your team or originated in, let's say the case of Ferrari, had an established national color. So in Formula One, there were a bunch of Italian teams. There was Alfa Romeo, there was Ferrari, uh, Maserati ran in Formula One. They were always all red. Germany their racing color was originally white, their national color. But one year in the 1950s, to save weight on a car in Formula One to make it go faster, they decided not to paint the cars white and just run them without any paint at all. And the cars were obviously made out of aluminum, so they appeared silver. And since then, silver has become the traditional color of German racing. And uh, if I were to argue on a color, this car might look great in a lot of different colors that we'll go through right now. But I'd argue if you're buying this car, you buy it in silver. I, I'm, I love this yellow. Don't get me wrong. I don't think it fits the car at all. I think it looks great. Um, I, I'm down with the silver, but I want to see that rainbow colored thing. That's well, that's, cus- that's for custom uh, exclusive colors. That yeah. just means you can bring in a shade of lipstick and they'll paint your car to, oh, to cool. match your yeah, white so lips. That's, oh, that's what 200 grand will get you. Because yeah. look, it's 3900 for the exclusive paint color. And then it is 6800 if you get exclusive matte paint color. Right. So that's, that's what these two are. But yeah. I mean, we've got we've got quite a few grays. We've got... I think it looks good in white and silver. Um, it probably oh, that's green. Color. Is that does that look green to you guys? No, I just saw yeah, green. It's got I a little out. green tint to it. Yeah. Well, there yeah. is that that new Porsche color um, that I, I saw actually on Hal Bear's Porsche. <laughs> it it's gray, and then you, until the sunlight hits it, and then oh yeah, it's like a gray green. I've seen it is so gorgeous. Yeah, it's oh. beautiful. Let's see it in white, Greg. White. 
the OG racing color for Germany. Well, yeah. I mean, that's it's not bad. I, I thought this was white, but apparently this is a gray as well. So there's Suzuka I like, gray. I like the silver. It's cool. That first one. Yeah. This one? If I, you know, I have the an lighter. old, I have an old uh, Mer- uh, 71 Mercedes 280 SL. And there was, when I bought it 28 years ago, there was no question what color that car was going to be. And what in year? Fact, it is Rob? a 71. It was the last year of the body style for the uh, SL before they changed to that boxy 70s looking design. Mm-hmm. I'm looking, I'm Googling it. Uh, yeah, 71 280 SL. Yeah. Um, I mean, what, were... what, which, uh, which, which, uh, Mercedes did, um, Rick have on, uh, Magnum PI? Uh, I don't remember. I just, that's remember obscure. How are you going to ask for it? He had an SL2. That's the only reason I asked, but his was later. Oh, this is a cool car. Why'd you get rid of it? I didn't get rid of it. It's sitting about 20 feet away from me. Oh, you still have it? <laughs> yeah no this is totally a a u car rob this thing's cool that yeah, that's I, the one with the the toolkit that you can't it looks ever, almost yeah. exactly yeah, it memory. almost looks like a like a sunbeam yeah but yeah it's got the nicer kind of look and it comes with a hard top that comes off and it's also got a soft top that folds into the into the trunk and it's yeah it's german racing silver with a black interior and a four-speed manual so cool. you know you, it, you, you mentioned one of these days you mentioned the Formula One color schemes, and you know I, I know they kind of carry over today, but there that that AMG with the teal, the silver and teal. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, I love that color combination, yeah. and, and it's not team, something I would normally gravitate towards. Right, and the nickname for Mercedes is to this day in Formula One the Silver Arrows, and that comes from when Mercedes decided not to paint those cars that one year, I think it was 1954, 55, and they became known as the Silver Arrows. Uh, Of note, America's Formula One color was white with a blue stripe. Oh, okay. I would have guessed blue. Um, What's up with the wheels? Is it just black and silver or what? It looks like it's it's two options and... Uh, one's Let's titanium and one's anthracite. Let's so see they're the both... anthracite. Uh, I cl- okay, there we go. Oh. You have to get what? Carbon, Carbon fiber, fiber front, front lip. I would I want that. We, I thought we got that. I thought we no, already got that with the sport upgrade. Well, let's uh, see what they look like. Not. Oh. I can't even tell the difference. I, I saw it. Yeah. Uh, can you cycle through the next uh, image of the car, Greg? Yeah. There we go. All right. And then throw it on. This one yeah, is only changing the wheels. Oh, I do like the darker wheels. Doesn't matter to me either way. I feel I like, like it. I, I like anthracite wheels and you know silver wheels just as long as it's not black. As I've said before, I'm really over just gloss black wheels at this point. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I. I again, those aren't my favorite wheel designs because they're asymmetric. Mm-hmm. But I think they look great, and I don't think I'd be changing them out anytime soon. And if you look there, I don't think there's any upcharge, uh, depending on the finish. I think it's a zero, zero yeah, it dollar is. upcharge. It is. So, it's a, yeah. it's a zero either way. So. so either way, pick whichever you guys like. I like the darker. Me I think too. it picks up all the other accents. Same. Yeah. All right. So now interior, Woo! man, I'm not going to lie. I, you know, I'm not a leather fan, but when you get into this quilted leather stuff, Mm-hmm. Mm, we start we start uh talking a little different <laughs> yeah what do you think um, rob red uh a, a, anything but like yellow blue or green yeah i could go for red i could go for gray stitching i could go for all black for sure so Just, here's the thing contrast do you stitching want $500. yeah do you want the contrast stitch or do you want the full color because i kind of like black with the contrast stitch let me see the yeah. full color it might look cool all right so here's here's the red. Ooh, God, that does look good. That's awesome on the silver I, car. I would never order it myself 
because I'd be afraid I, I'd get it and then eventually hate it. But I must say that does look cool. Well, let, let's see what just that looks like. Now, if we go to just the contrast selection. Saves us five grand. No, because we add it again here and it's okay. $500 more. Oh, interesting. So let me see what it looks like if it even shows. That's, I don't like it's, that as much. it's subtle, but I, yeah, I, I'm with you. So let's go back to this and see what it looks like here. No way, man. I'm, I don't know. I, I feel like, yeah, I think, I think, I think this car can get away with the, the red interior. Yeah. It's, so. while it's, you know, you picked kind of a, a basic color for a very ostentatious car. So then when you get on the inside, it's kind of like, bam, you know, it pops. Yeah, I mean, I, I have no problem with the red. Like I said, yeah. I, I would be hesitant to, to order my $200,000 car with the red interior. Um, I, I think I'd go for that. I mean, really, like daily driven, I think I could do this. I could see you doing that too, Rob, uh, with the red interior, with a white suit, your long hair flowing, <laughs> you know, a silk shirt underneath with big lapels. Yeah, big gold chain. <laughs> All right, so so let's go with the plus the red is five hundred dollars cheaper than the contrast stitch. Well, That's surprising. You yeah, you got to match the interior with the brake calipers, oh, right? No ifs, right. ands, or buts. All right, like I like I told Bear when I was down there last week. Uh, you know, they told me that they can change the colors to whatever they want because they have all that, but they do a color change option. Mm -hmm. And he's like, so if you if you ever want to change out your red you know calipers we can do it to whatever you want and i looked at them and i was like are you crazy <laughs> i picked yeah. red because i like red and i don't want yeah. to change that plus you know even though brembo now offers a, a rainbow of colors mm -hmm. the original hey i've got high performance brakes on my car color yeah. was brembo red and well, i'm yeah. still down with that well so. i mean i didn't we have this discussion with the building the mustang gt the the I performance pack is actually, black and it, yeah, I don't like and that. The Challenger also offers uh, like orange, black, yeah. and ceramic gray in addition to red. And we all decided, no, nah, it's got to be red. So. Yeah, because because that kills me. The Brembo upgrade on a Mustang, unless it's a GT 500 or 350, right, is black and that, black, which what? is stupid. The default should be red. Clearly, yeah. So I mean, I guess they had to have something to upgrade to the the next level so that right. people that buy the performance pack will upgrade to the gt500 brakes right um but it, okay so when we i guess we paid the 7200 when we got the so you get the that darker included. wheels oh the darker wheels yeah, yeah. i snuck that in there look at that all that carbon fire 300 dollars for black audi rings and badges worth it that's that's a, really that's, that's such that's a, a no-brainer what, really? what are you gonna do plastic dip it rob no, I'd just leave it <laughs> silver. I don't no, care. Crap. Yeah. yeah you, everything else is carbon or black. You got to come on. Yeah. Oh, one thing I would want is a carbon fiber front anti sway bar. How dope is that? That's I didn't even know Hold on. they made no, carbon I gotta, fiber. I got to read this. I got to I gotta get into the technology on read, this. But read this it in a German true. accent. 4.4 <laughs> pounds lighter compared to standard <laughs> spray bar. Is that <laughs> stiff and that's good? Greg, have you built anything with uh, with with carbon anti-roll bars and stuff? I didn't no. even know they existed. To be no, honest. I thought I was fancy because I, I had uh, hollow uh, sway bars on one car. I thought I was fancy because I installed a Helvig, uh, uh, a thick, thick metal anti sway bar on my Grand Cherokee, and it was the best mod I did to that car. You guys have I, sway bars? <laughs> huh? I said you guys have sway bars. Yeah, <laughs> it's like that. Meme. Believe it or not, the Grand Cherokee when you get the Hemi five seven engine, it comes with sway bars. But uh, the aftermarket company Helwig makes uh, much more robust units, and it took me like an hour on my back in the driveway swapping out the rear sway bar. Totally changed the dynamics of the car. It was the best mod I've I've done to that car. Nice. Now, now here's my genuine question have they built it to have the exact same spring rate essentially and mm. you know torsional stiffness as a steel one and it's just lighter or you're talking about the carbon fiber yeah one? or mm. is the carbon fiber one just lighter greg it's 
doesn't matter. It's, it's carbon. Just okay. <laughs> <laughs> like I've got, I've got so many questions about this. Like, <laughs> literally, if anybody can put me in touch with an Audi engineer, I just want to talk. Like I won't even turn the recorder on. Let's just talk. That what if you found out it was just like like steel, but it was wrapped in carbon? <laughs> it's carbon. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> All right. So look, yes, because look, here's the contrast stitching for 500. We already opted against that. Right. How, how is the B&O upgrade cheaper than a Mopar B&O upgrade? Well, uh, the Mopar upgrade isn't even B&O. It's, it's uh, Harman Kardon, Kardon. Okay. which isn't even as good as B&O. Oh, it's, it's the Mustang that's B&O. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Olufsen. So, I mean. I would but, get it. Hold on, let's, yeah. let's read about it. Let's. I mean, what's nineteen hundred dollars? You know, because you've got the most awesome sound system sitting right behind you. Right, but you're already at two hundred and thirteen thousand dollars. What's nineteen hundred dollars okay. more? All right. Greg, speaking of that, I mean, and that's coming oh. from a guy I never upgrade the audio systems yeah. in my car. And in fact, Greg and I, before we started the the broadcast tonight, we're talking about how they upcharge you like two grand for basically just a subwoofer and a few extra speakers. And it's just never worth it. But yeah, well, um, I don't know. I like it. When I had a new edge Mustang, it had like the Mach 1000 uh, stereo system in it. And I enjoyed it. Granted, I bought the car used, so I wasn't the one being charged that, you know, yeah. upcharge, but well, see, I enjoyed my it. For me, the, the reason why I come at this saying I never upgrade the stereo system it, it, on my toys, like my muscle cars and stuff, I, I drive them infrequently enough. So they're not daily drivers. I take them out on a Sunday and all I want to hear is, is a massive V8. I, yeah. I rarely even have the radio on when I'm driving my challenger or anything like that. So, but I mean, guys, look at look at where we're at. Price no, you're price right. You're right. Price. I mean, it's, it's yeah. negligible, you know. At this so. point, yeah, just get everything that's offered. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. All Even right. the, the $300 black Audi rings. <laughs> Greg, so, I mean, the only the, option we have not done is the contrast stitching. That's literally yeah. the only cop option we didn't go for. Get it. Yeah. We don't know because I'm we just lose, kidding. I'm I was, just... Uh, then we lose the red. Oh, yeah. What if the red gets black contrast stitching? Can we do that? I'm not sure. No, yeah. it, it goes black only. Okay. Oh, it goes black only. Um, I was like, that would be cool with some Greg, black. Yeah. What, um, we kind of glossed over this, and I don't know if we're going to like get another chance to really discuss it. So I wanted to ask you about that V10 a little bit more. Okay. Um, what, uh, what can you tell us about it? Like what's, what makes it so special? Like Rob was talking about, about it earlier, you know, how Audi was like one of the first manufacturers to offer a, a V10. Um, what just makes that it, configuration so special? Okay. It's not special in that it's like glorious, right? Cause that would be a, an I six or a V12 because they have the perfect, uh, you know, second and third order harmonics and they all balance each other and they, they balance it's, it's not special like that. It's special because it's a bit of an engineering challenge. Why is uh, that? It's, it's, I mean, it, it's an odd number of, of uh, cylinders. So you have an odd firing harmonic mm. issue, but Interesting. because Audi, like we talked about with the five cylinder, perfected that, what's a V10? It's yeah, just, I mean, their, their V10 a, is essentially two inline I5s. Five yeah. So I mean, what's the what was the key to that? What made them do it better than anybody else? They're smart. I mean, they, they figured Audi, it out. They're Germans and German engineering, as we all know, is just, they just their what, culture found, is found a way to balance it. There's well, no it, specific like keys. Yeah, it's not like they just take it and and it's going to shake itself apart. It's just harder to manage the second and third order harmonics. Mm. Okay. Um. So you've got. You know, all you have to do is, okay, well, I need a, a power pulse every, what, 720 divided by, uh, but divided by five, you know? So yeah, it's some kind of awkward number, right? Let me do, now you, good, thanks. Yeah, that's going to make me have to do this. So 720 <laughs> divided by five. Well, people want to know, Greg. So that, so that's a, a power pulse every 144 degrees of engine rotation. Um, it's going way it's it, yeah, above it's, my pay grade here, but I mean, I'm it's just it's, and learning. That's a goofy number. That's all. It's mm -hmm. just a goofy okay. number. 
Um, mm-hmm. So it's not common, but you know, that you're adding an extra cylinder, like, well, conversely, case, when cylinders. do you have a power pulse on like, let's say a, a V8, a V8, you would have every eight divided by 720. So four, three, six, 90 degrees. So I imagine a, again, yeah, you're doing the same thing to me, but a power pulse is what, like, a, is that on the power? A combu- a co- yeah. A combustion event. Okay. So it's at the, so it's the bang at the end of the compression stroke. Yes. Okay. That, that's when you would push down. And gotcha. ideally you would have one happening every single, you know, an even number. Cause if you have an oddly spaced, then you get like weird lumpy and it starts to just shake itself apart. And interesting. Yeah. So they figured out a way to take something that was difficult to engineer. And now it's like a sewing machine. Yeah, and interestingly, once again, we go back to Formula One back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, Formula One was unlimited in terms of the number of cylinders you could run. So some cars like Ferrari always traditionally ran flat 12s, uh, whereas the uh, British car makers like Lotus and BRM and stuff like that always preferred V8s for lightness. Um, you know, V12, flat 12s put out a ton of power, but they were as heavy as a hippo. V8s, less power, but very light. Um, In the 90s, there was a confluence of engineering thought that said, you know, V12s are too heavy. V8s are not powerful enough. And V10s became the optimum uh, choice in the early 1990s. Uh, Renault actually uh was the one that really pushed the v10 and it became so successful that in 1996 formula one mandated that all cars had to run v10s and you no longer had a choice so from 1996 until 2006 the v10 was the formula one formula interesting so yeah and compare an engine like the one that we're talking about, maybe like an earlier iteration uh, from Audi to let's say the V10 that uh, Dodge was producing for the Viper. Um, is it just like a, a higher level of, of refinement? How do they oh, stack? Yeah. Well, it's, it's that. And don't forget, Vinny, you're talking about a mid-engine car here. And a V10 right. is a very heavy, long uh, engine because you've got five cylinders you know, running in parallel to one another. It's very a long block. Uh, the Viper, although it was astonishing that they decided to put a V10 in it, it was front engine, which is horrible for vehicle dynamics. Right. This has all the benefits of a V10, namely power and, 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 and other technical aspects, and they put it in the right position in the car, which is between the, the two axles. So for, for optimum in, in weight distribution and, and and other uh, i would love to go over the specs of the first generation viper and some of the other vipers as well because those are really cool cars maybe in a future episode we can discuss them uh i think i've distracted you guys long enough from this build so yeah time to click summary i think greg all right what do we got here let's see is that it that's everything that that was everything yeah oh shoot okay well then i don't feel bad about uh talking about all this stuff yeah these cars come pretty much loaded except for you know little aesthetics like like Three, seat color and wheel color. Seven. look at it's doing a bunch of the research for us we usually have to google all this oh stuff. Like nice that. look at that that's beautiful yep see now right off the bat what jumps out at me the very first spec right there is acceleration <laughs> mm-hmm. and guys the c8 corvette beats that by almost half a second that's but we're gonna have to dive into the rest performance parts for your american classic are available from pol at performanceonline.com pol is the perfect upgrade for your classic car or truck whether you're hitting the strip or going on a road trip pol's performance braking steering suspension fuel injection exhaust radiators rear ends and more are top notch it can be seen in our showroom floor cruise on down to our show stopping showroom and take a look at our brand new blackout series parts or order pol parts from performanceonline.com and have them shipped straight to your garage and we're back. All right, guys, are you ready to score this? I am bag? ready. I've got I've got the awesome new spreadsheet ready. So yes. Oh, 
So we wow. don't have to, nobody has to write guru. anything down. I just <laughs> the tech guru in. busting out the expe- Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> wow, it took me way too long to remember to do this. <laughs> well, I, I knew it was only a matter of time. Well, it's certainly going to make my obligatory question that's about to come out like, okay, so this did it in 3.2 seconds. Greg, what was the number? Oh, I don't have that spreadsheet. Oh, no. Oh, no. This is just a spreadsheet of our scores. Oh, the scoring scoring spreadsheet. No, I'm not that. I'm not. No, well, that's kind of what I meant. What did I (laughs) vote in terms of horsepower? Yes. Yeah, we will will have that going forward. We will have that all filed away. Okay. Well, we don't have our previous scores, Greg. I have. Well, I do have our C8s because I okay. knew we would need that, but I do not have the other ones entered. I did Perfect. enter the C8 stuff. Oh, so well, I was, about I was that. that we retire, Greg, we'll have a compendium of our <laughs> our opinion, uh, our opinions on these scores. <laughs> Comp- <laughs> no, and it'll be worth precisely nothing. But <laughs> zero, zero. No one All in right. the world will ever care. Well, I, ju- <laughs> I just entered the uh, the price which is the only thing we have to enter and the only variable. Did so, you set it up to where it just, it just turns red. It, just, it, it's like, Oh, that's a lot of money. Oof, uh, <laughs> alarms but, just start going off. Yeah. So, but yeah, two fourteen nine ninety is a whole lot different. And than, what do you want to bet? What do you want to bet? There's no gas guzzler tax in that. Oh, figure. they did. No, I'm, I'm looking at, they didn't list any of that. No delivery they, destination. They chart. did. They did. Wow. 1,495 destinations. That's actually charge. reasonable because a challenger, I know for a fact, has like, uh, it's it's around that range too. So if, I re- if I remember right, the C8 was right at 1,000. Is that right? Yeah. I, I think so. That's just, I don't know why that sticks out in my head. So maybe I'm wrong, but yeah. It's because they have to use two barges to deliver the parts for the challenger. Uh, Greg, he's still at it, and you're still laughing. Right? <laughs> oh boy, the splitter right. bugs, dude, handle with care. Yeah. Oh, I should have sent that video to Rob. Look, look, <laughs> when when I need to fit three dead hookers in the back <laughs> of the trunk of a car, my challenger is going to transport them just fine, and I challenge either one of you. That's guys. when you go rent the town car. Yeah, because yeah. you never use your own vehicle for that. No, never use your own Challenger to transport dead bodies. So, uh, <laughs> all right. So, well, all jokes aside, are we ready to to yeah. um, get into the specs? I believe the first category is power and uh, torque. torque numbers. Yep. And so, okay, so our numbers are six hundred and two horsepower, because as Rob has pointed out, is it's detuned from the Huracan model uh, variant, I should say, not model. Uh, max torque, surprisingly to me, is only 413 pound feet. Mm-hmm. And there's a reason for that. Typically, uh, German cars typically have lower torque numbers than an equivalent performance American or Italian manufacturer because they figure they build these cars really for their own domestic market primarily and they think of america and stuff sometimes as an afterthought and you don't need torque on an autobahn to go fast you need horsepower to go fast you know on on limited speed limit roads what's the old saying uh uh horsepower is how fast you hit the guardrail torque is how far you push it yeah, mm-hmm. uh, but I think it would have been this. This cause... basically means looking at this, you can tell that it revs a lot higher. Yeah, it's um, a very high revving uh, and sweet revving engine. I've never been in an R8, but I have been in a Huracan, and I was in a Lamborghini Gallardo, which was the predecessor to the Huracan, which was also a 10, 10, uh, uh, 10 cylinder engine and these cars man when when you blip the throttle the needle is just moving so fast you know it just loves to get into the high rpms quickly well i just just for you know giggles i looked up the maximum rpm from the factory yep. 8700 wow so, you yeah. know the Le- lexus lfa is always heralded uh, by critics as having one of the sweetest revving and sounding engines uh, built in, you know, non-racing engines built. And that only revs to 9,000. So this is right there, 
I think the Corvette, LT2. the LT2 revs to what, like seven? I think factory is 72. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Um, but I mean, let's, let's be a hundred percent honest. The sound does make up for something. Um, sure. Yeah. So, but I mean, I mean 602. The, well, okay. So it beats the vet as far as horsepower is concerned, but it's but not like on par with the torque. Well, well and also two is four. Ooh, that's, that's what I'm saying. They're both in the, fo- in the neighborhood of 400. Yeah. Right. But you know, as we've been saying all along, as we built our muscle cars and now we're in our sort of hyper sports car, uh, uh, shootout, um, you know, we're, we're voting, uh, we're going to be voting on four cars in this category. And there has to be a car that has the least amount of horsepower. And then the one that has the most, we, you know, the Corvette is, is going to have the least amount of horsepower in this group. I think we all all, voted that way. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also, Um, it's also the one that is legitimately out of its league. Not right. I shouldn't say that that's wrong. Well, it's just breaking into this league correct yeah and uh so i think i would make a note to you guys before we actually come up with our own personal numbers that although 600 horsepower is certainly nothing to sniff at and in a car that's probably only like 3400 pounds 3500 pounds it's it's a lot of power it doesn't exactly eclipse that lt2 though no, but but my point really is, you know, when we get to the like the Ferrari F8 or the, uh, McLaren, you know, the F8 is in the 800 horsepower exactly. range or very close. So, uh, you know, if the Corvette was a three and, and we know the F8 is going to be a five, you know, vote accordingly here. Well, remember, we, we put the three five or the Corvette at three five across the board. All the yeah. Times. Yeah, uh, I, that's where I was going to be at. I was going to be at like 3.7, 3.8. Yeah. I'm, with, I'm with Vinny. I couldn't give this car a four because I know what we're going to be voting on soon. But I also uh, so. I also would give it a little bit more because like you said, the horsepower to weight ratio, mm-hmm. this is slightly lighter than a, a C8. Yeah, but, yeah but, this, but the category is not horsepower to weight. Right? I, I understand. I'm just saying it's a more effective use of the horsepower. So I'm going to kind of weight its horsepower a little more. Um, or you could wait to do that in the performance category. True. That yeah. one. So True. I'm, 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 with I'm still Vinny. not giving it a four. It's not no, giving a four. No, I'm with Vinny on this one. And if he's going three, seven to five to three, eight, um, yeah, I'm right there. Three, well. seven, five is fair. Um, three, seven, five as well. All right. So just to be difficult, I'm going to do 3.8. Because I've got a spreadsheet <laughs> and I don't have to actually count anymore. <laughs> so 3.75 across the board. Well, 3.75 and 3.8 for me. Because it's got to be difficult. Okay. All right. So next one's handling. Uh, uh, now, I believe you got us some skid pad and Nurburgring numbers. Yeah, so the, the skid pad to- numbers are a little iffy. Um, it doesn't appear that there's any actual published hard. This is the, the number. Um, there's a couple places that mention about 1G, literally with the word about. Uh, they also mention that the Huracan, which is kind of its twin, is at about 1.1. So, the same as where the vet was, right? <laughs> if I remember correctly. Or no, the vet was 0.9 or something. 0. 0.9, it was 0.98. 0.97 something like that mm-hmm. um so and i'm what did we give the corvette three fives yes i'm inclined to say if it's not published and people are saying things like about one it's just like the corvette and it's slightly under that's yeah. that's my gut feeling that's what i'm thinking and even uh periodicals like road and track car and driver don't have skid pad numbers as far as you've nothing nothing official nothing okay i mean th- this there's a car and driver one and it's the one that kind of talks about the uh, the huracan mm-hmm. um, well for the viewers out there the huracan and the rh share uh the same four-wheel drive system they have the same engine albeit in the r8 it's detuned by about 100 horsepower i believe 
Um, although if I'm not mistaken, the suspension geometry between the two cars is different. Yeah. Um, but you know, if you're seeing numbers at about 1.1 for the Huracan and about one for the R8, I guess we could pretty much go with 1G is, is probably where we're at with it, which does beat the Corvette. So if we gave the Corvette a three, five, I think I'd be willing to go a four, any car that's pulling a full G laterally. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. See, that's yeah. the thing. I, I don't know that it is one G. Yeah. Um, I'm just, I'm thinking it's slightly better than the Corvette, if anything. So I'm, I'm at the same place I was before three point yeah. three point seven seven five. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. I'll do the same three, seven, five. Yeah. I mean, and honestly, I think when we start getting into the Nurburgring time, you're, it's going to start to make sense. Okay. Because I don't want to spoil anything, but it's not. No, definitely. It's and it's what is that lackluster? I'm, I'm, I'm. Yeah. What is that time? Just to confirm our vote. So Seven far. minutes thirty-two seconds. And where was the vet? Seven thirty. Seven twenty-eight, wasn't it? Oh. Okay. Seven, but something like that like but the gt500 was like 711 right? 706 seven so, yeah it was cooking this is yeah see that's what i'm saying so it's the 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 about one makes sense when we're talking you know in the 730s fair enough so i'm not i'm not gonna question that too hard i mean again well, i'm not a supercar expert i'm no supercar grand one. less Mm -hmm. you know can i ask a question that's probably going to open a kettle of worms because it's a it's a question we maybe should have asked um before we even started the corvette like maybe back in the muscle car uh shootout um do we figure breaking into this type of performance it was overall yeah, I came performance. Into performance yeah, yeah. I, at least that's where i was you know this car weight. I, I went back and forth with that, Rob. I was like, should that be under uh, handling or should that be under performance? Okay. Um, but this since we were doing all the zero to 60 and like quarter mile uh, yeah. measurements in the performance, I was like 60 to zero. Yeah. Okay. Because, you know, this car comes standard with ceramic, uh, carbon ceramic brakes, mm -hmm. which on other cars like a 911 is like an $11,000 upgrade and offers incredible stopping power over standard steel discs. So, you know, and that's the funny thing. I'm looking at the, the performance sheet. Nobody lists the 60 to zero distance. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be fair, I didn't search 60 to zero. So let me do that now while we discuss other stuff and well sure. what's the next uh the next category well, greg didn't vote yet yeah oh, yeah. i'm sorry Three, uh, 375 no oh, i was right okay. i was right there with you guys sorry sorry, yeah. sorry. yeah no next is interior uh oh, okay. interior amenities comfort etc i've been in more standard audi sedans uh like uh four a4s s4s i've been in an s6 um, Audi does the best interior for the money um, anywhere in those categories. It's a, a hell lot of a lot better. better than BMWs. What's that? The hell of a lot better than BMW. Oh, BMW interiors are crap. Mercedes interiors are wonderful, but yep. Audi, uh, if you look at most publications like Car and Driver, Road and Track, they always give top marks to. You think Audi, Audi, Audi interior is better than Mercedes interior? Yes. Wow. Yes. That's impressive. Okay. So, I mean, we all marveled at the quilted uh, in, seats, just judging from the kind of crappy photos on their, on their configurator. I can guarantee you, you climb in this thing and you're blown away by the interior. Having said that, I bet you it doesn't blow you away like the interior of a Ferrari F8. Um, so I'm going to give it a 4.2. Five. Yeah, but what about the car specifically? Like, I, we didn't really cover it too much when we built the car because there wasn't too much to go over. But you, I didn't see like an info. I didn't ergonomics see, and stuff. Yeah, I didn't see any infotainment center. I didn't even get to see what the steering wheel looked like. Um, so, well, Greg, do you want to pull up? Yeah, that was. Uh, we had it up for a little bit. Uh, okay. Let me. Get yeah, I, I mean, I'm going on my past experience with other Audis that they I'm saying, use. like, I don't, I don't have one. Um, 
-hmm. They so, use the absolute highest quality in everything. There's no cheap plastics anywhere, which BMW, as we all know, has fallen prey to recently. Um, their nav system, which I believe is called MMI, um, it gets high marks from most publications, much better than BMW and Mercedes's combat. Uh, Mercedes interior is stellar, man. So if it's better than Mercedes. Is. My, my dad's had multiple. My dad had an SL, like a 2007 SL. He's had an S class. Uh, Mercedes builds interiors, but I'm telling you, you know, ask your average German and they'll all tell you that the Audi is tops. Oh, I, okay. Now I remember. Well, they give me a flat bottom steering wheel, which I like. With a um, notice on the steering wheel, you have the engine start button. It, I, I was just about to say that. I like that. That's cool. <laughs> um, hey, Greg, you can expand that photograph with those two. Yeah. Oh, it's still um, yeah, it's still pretty crop, but it's fine. The shifter placement is kind of dumb. I don't like that. Um, I mean, I don't know where else you're gonna put it, but I don't like the shape of it. I don't really. Eh. I mean, I don't know. I, I wish it was a wider picture, a wider angle. I I could see what's going on a little bit lower, but. I mean, that's really yeah. Yeah. maybe maybe just do a Google search for Audi R8 dashboard and just find it. It doesn't even have like navigation or inf infotainment center. What's up with that? It does. It, is it like I it pops up. Okay. I, I think it pops, it raises out of the dashboard or something. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, the, see, I'm glad we looked it up because the shifter doesn't really bother me now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, can you see Vinny uh, forward of the shifter? There we go. Right there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the screen pops out from somewhere there gotcha and yeah, the command me... knob uh um, yeah i don't yeah i don't mind that shifter I, in the pic in the original picture it looked a lot looked like the shifter was a lot taller let's see nothing nothing yeah i don't see any infotainment center uh, maybe, go back greg maybe it's integrated into the cluster where like Ooh. you see the you see the knob like... in the console behind the shifter mm -hmm. yeah that controls your infotainment. So it is somewhere. And it might be instead of having a separate uh, screen, it just gets integrated into the gauge cluster. The dash, yeah. Yeah. Um, can you go back, Greg, to where all the images were? Uh, where is it? Um, I thought I saw an image that had the little, oh, okay. So to the bottom right, the second, second one in. There you go. That's not that's, an R8. That's not, no, okay, that's, never mind. That's remember, a, this is Bing search, so <laughs> I mean, right. it's it's not even Google. Well, listen, it's not the end of the world if it doesn't have one. I just I'm curious yeah. if it does or not. Yeah, I'm just I'm I'm not even gonna go by. I'm not even gonna pretend like I know what that would look like or feel like to sit in, but I like it. I'm digging on this interior. Uh, yeah, aesthetically, it's it's very pleasing, um, but. I just, you know, I, comfort and amenities is also important. Um, and well, so you know, Audi sedans um, are extremely uh, tech heavy. Um, uh, every amenity, as you said, every bell and whistle is incorporated in them. It could be that the R8 is a little, you know, stripped down from there. Does it have like heated toe ticklers like uh, well, i don't does know have the, that the but, bucket seats are heated okay. yeah but like for example when we do the mclaren you're going to be shocked at how spartan a mclaren interior is i like would that, be that's i would be design. less surprised by that than the audi because like you said their 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 regular vehicles are you know equipped with everything right um, it could be in their Halo hypercar. They decided to make it much more driver focused and do away with distractions and things. I like respect that. that. That's cool. Um, yep. I was just trying to get to the bottom of it. I, I don't know, Greg. What would you score this thing? Well, I gave the I gave the C8 a three point five, and I like this interior more. Um, so I got, but I don't. I want to leave room. So I mean, four. I think four would be fair to it. It doesn't necessarily leave a ton of room to go up. 
but I think it's fair. Did I say four or 4.5? You said 4.5. You change mine to a four as well. Okay. I'd give it a 3.9 again because it's missing the heads up display. I don't like that. I think at this level, all cars should have it. And I'm not going to fall. Do we know for sure it doesn't? I didn't uh, see one on there. It, it wasn't listed, but let's just let's search. Um, I do like the flat bottom steering wheel. That was cool. Audi but, design is not. It's not to. It's not my favorite. Like, um, it's not warm. German cars are not warm. They're sort of a, devoid exactly. of of love. Like, but I kind of like that. You get into a Ferrari and it's about passion and love and everything is just so exquisitely handmade and German cars are more Teutonic, really. Yeah, they're utilitarian they're, for sure. They're right. extremely functional and well thought out, but there's no romance to a German car. Exactly, like and that's where they lose me. So that's why I'm not giving it a four. It's just kind of like, it's a nice interior, it's functional, it gets the job done, but it's kind of just like, meh. Yeah. I agree with you. All right. So then the next one is we're back to performance. So I will pull up the performance specs. Uh, we have a zero to 60 time of 2.9 seconds. Ciao. Beaten by a C8 Corvette fractionally. What is it? One tenth between yeah. the two cars? Yeah. Quarter mile. Quarter miles, 10.6 at 134.5. That what beat was the, the Corvette. The Corvette was 10.8, I think. Okay, so two tenths faster. Yeah. Uh, the eighth mile, which is a little indicative of, of its performance curve, uh, is 7.4. Wow. And 109. But here's the thing. That is almost dead on with NHRA's split. Because NHRA has an eighth mile split, and it's 1.56, I think. So yeah, but that's like I mean, it takes a minute to spool up, I guess. Huh? But that's the thing you wouldn't you wouldn't expect this kind of car to match NHRA's split time. No, right? I wait, guess hold not, on. But Let me do the math. I, I may be off by a second. One. When you say split time, can you explain that a little bit better? Okay, so well, when when you run the eighth mile, right? Because they have all their safety regulations are based on your quarter mile ET. Right. So if something's nine ninety nine, which is ten flat, right? So mm -hmm. if it's 999, you would divide it by 1.56. Okay. And so when you go 640 in the eighth mile. So I, I have this off a little bit because uh that would be 640 for 999. Well, that was so it, is this basically indicative of mid-range torque and power, or if I'm seeing this right, so it's 1060 divided by 1.56. Yeah, it should. If it was the NHRA split, it should be running a 679 eighth mile and it's running a 7.4 second eighth mile. Mm -hmm. So that tells me somewhere between its awesome 2.9 second uh, 60 foot or um, 60 mile an hour and the eighth mile is laying over. Something okay. is laying over there and then it's kicking. Well, we established it. Again. We established it's not a super torquey engine. That's number one. And yeah. Uh, and number two, of course, as we all know, gearing has a lot to do, uh, as much to do really, uh, with, with numbers like this as, as pure power, um, you know, a tall, uh, or a short first gear, uh, versus, a uh, you know, uh, uh, higher gear, you know, yeah. higher numbers, like higher up in the, in the year range, um you know constitute different numbers and this car as i said before was really designed for fast autobahn uh cruising it's not a drag strip car that's not really what the car was designed for so stands to reason maybe it lacks a little oomph uh you know in this low mid-range as yeah. opposed to like high-end um acceleration and performance yeah and and in looking at the that's the thing that the zero to whatever ladder, right? So zero to 40, zero to 50, zero to 80. It doesn't show a marked layover mm -hmm. anywhere in it. Um, mm -hmm. Out of curiosity, do you have top speed? Uh, top speed, uh, 206. 
Wow. So three thirty one kilometers. Uh, that's not something that we've talked about very much before. Top um, of all top, no. top speed is so foreign to me, and I think it's it's so like it, it's, it's kind like of zero a, to sixty, right? Like you can manipulate the shit out of everything. Just to, yeah, but it's also you know what is I I never look at top speed numbers as serious performance figures for one salient reason, and that is there is no place in the continental United States where you can safely go you know max out a car like this oh, because the texas no, mile. yeah you could do it at the texas mile but shy of that there's really nothing because no racetrack like coda doesn't have straights long enough indianapolis doesn't have a straight long enough to I mean, max silver, out. silver state challenge stuff. I mean, there's, there's top speed events yeah there's top speed events but like in terms of um like your typical road course there's nothing that's gonna have a straight that's long enough to max this car out and where when and where are you ever going to do 200 miles and max out one of these cars anyway much more important to me are zero to 60 quarter mile things like that yeah. or what i always look towards for performance yeah i just um, th that split just really confuses me because it doesn't show up in a, in the in the ladder test so I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe I'm putting a little bit of suspect on these numbers. You know what Could I mean? Could be that. And again, I can't I can't stress enough. This is an Autobahn cruiser. Mm -hmm. um, it wouldn't account for discrepancy in numbers, but I can authoritatively tell you that this car is designed for smooth, effortless, high speed running on on yeah. Autobahn type freeways. So. You know, they probably geared and and, uh, you know, made the torque curve uh, and power curve um, aimed at achieving those, you know, high speed numbers. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to ding it for it, though. <laughs> like i'm not no i mean it's a it's a it's a fast car and as i mentioned although you said you couldn't you're not finding uh breaking numbers um yeah. i gotta reiterate oh, I, did, I did find breaking oh you I, did yeah and uh we're at 98 feet oof. 60 to zero oof wow that'll send your dentures hitting the, the windshield yeah um yeah i mean these are 11 th on on a 9 11 if you option the very same brakes it's the very same ceramic discs carbon ceramic discs it's an eleven thousand dollar upgrade on 9 11 turbo so um wow. there's probably few cars on the planet that can hold with this going 60 to zero well i i can give you a a car and driver test oh did i lose that I may have put it away. Um, yeah, I did. There was a car and driver test that had like the top 35 or whatever. And uh, yeah, getting under that 100 mark is pretty, yeah. pretty rarefied air. Yeah. Um, again, guys, we're going to be comparing this to an Acura NSX, a Ferrari F8, and a McLaren of uh some iteration uh you know these numbers are nothing to stiff sniff at it's a sub three second car to 60 miles an hour um it's faster than the corvette in the quarter mile um uh if you could refresh me on my fours across the board yeah i'd have to go 4.25 it beats the corvette yeah. right with before yeah. you told me what I what I gave the Corvette, I was going to give this one a four, actually. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe so, we were a little generous with the Corvette. I don't know that we were generous with the Corvette. I just think well, that the Corvette is faster to 60. That's what I'm saying. I think they're just comparable. You know what I mean? This one edging out the Corvette a little bit. I want to give it a 4.1. Well, it, it edges it out. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, in terms of uh, this car edges the Corvette in quarter mile skid pad as far as we know nurburgring by uh you know a couple seconds yeah a couple seconds so across the board no, the, it is uh, a... the vet was faster than the nurburgring wasn't it by mm, a couple seconds yeah no, it was the this other one, one. Was no. four point, this, was a, a, this one was 730 around. something and the vet was 720 something wait i back oh 
You guys got me opening up so many damn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, this is seven thirty-two, and I think the vet was seven thirty-six. Okay, okay, never mind then. So basically, we're talking about a car that is fractionally quicker than the Corvette in every metric except zero to sixty, where it only loses by a tenth. Right. So um, I mean, if you gave tenths. the Corvette Wait, no, one, um, tenth. one tenth, right? Yeah. 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 Um, so if you gave the Corvette a four, Vinny, I mean, that's how I base my 4.25. No, I, I don't think you're wrong. I don't think you're wrong. I just want, I, I think there's, okay. So I think the distance between uh, the Corvette and this R8 is lesser than the distance from the R8 and the VET from the Ferrari that we're going to do. And so I want to leave that room. You know what I mean? So that's why I landed at 4.1. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I, I think I'm in a 4.2. Um, you can't let one minor spec like that being the zero to six or 60 to, yes, yeah, zero to 60 time, uh, affect the rest. Cause it does outperform it. I just don't think it blows the vet out of the water. You know what I mean? No, it's, but en enough that it deserves more, some pat on the back. That's um, fair. And, and also guys, I mean, there are intangibles that we can't even get into because we're not road testing these cars. Yeah. I can promise you at 160 miles an hour, this thing is like driving on glass where the Corvette, you're going to start hearing little fiberglass squeaks. And I don't, I don't know that for sure. I don't know. I've never done it. So uh, German engineer. I've owned quite a few German cars, including I still have my Mercedes and I, I owned a bunch of turbo BMWs. What about um, things like, uh, like uh, the tread width on the tires. We didn't see that on this car. Whereas we saw, you know, saw that on the vet um look that up you know what i mean stuff yeah. like that um i guess it doesn't really matter because the performance is what the performance is i, I just i get curious exactly the same as the corvette actually a little bit wider in the rear okay 245 front 305 rear mm -hmm. wow skinny up front that, well with the mid-engine car you're not yeah. trying to fight all that weight Mm -hmm. yeah. you you can do that like there's also a narrow dynamic benefit to having narrower fronts yeah. interesting okay well uh yeah i'm still i'm i might give it a little bump like 4.4.15 I, I don't know but that's i mean not. if i don't think 4.1 is unfair i mean no. i'm giving it a 4.2 just because i do think it's a little bit more than that over the corvette but you know what? I'm going with my original instinct, 4.1, but I think maybe uh, you guys have convinced me, you know I mean? Maybe I should have given it a little bit more, but I'm not going to change yeah. my answer now. Well, the, ne the next one is price. Um, it's This is getting tough for me because it was easy to give the Corvette a five. Well, right? Look at the performance, right? So like, I'm like, I'm like right there, like with the Corvette and we're talking about a car that's, you know, well over a hundred thousand dollars more than the vet that we made so i give this thing like a two yeah i i kind of feel like especially since its competitors are going to be way better performing for their extra mm -hmm. money that's what I, that, that's exactly what i'm saying yeah, yeah well I, but you guys wait a sec you're you're mixing up then price with value and those are two different judgments i thought that's what this whole thing was about Oh, I thought yeah. value was a separate well, category. Well, actual technical value is the dollar per point. That's that's where we're doing. But oh, the, I price, see. the price has always been relative to what you're getting. Okay. Like it's, it's just. Well, yeah. I mean, the C8 blows everything we're going to do away. Which is why it's five. Well, that that's why it was the Corvette versus the world. Right. I mean, that was the Corvette's strength is that you're getting supercar performance at a, literally like, a, you know, <laughs> a sedan, a sedan, like a nice sedan price, like a BMW. I'm glad we did this one second, because I think more than any other car that we build, this is the car that's going to prove that, yes, you do get supercar performance from the Corvette 100%. for that price. Yeah. Right. Well, in my estimation, I mean, look, $214,000 and we don't even know what taxes and, and you know, aside from destination charge. Well, I'm registering it in Montana, so I'm not paying those taxes. <laughs> um, you know, that's a lot of money. Uh, you're getting a lot of car for it. You're getting things that the Corvette doesn't offer. 
uh, in terms of German engineering refinement. Uh, you know, I know Vinny, you just got finished saying, well, I don't know that for sure. Cause I've never been in either one of them. Uh, but you know, German engineering is peerless. Um, I'm sure at Autobahn speeds, this car just, I mean, there's not a vibration or a bad harmonic anywhere in this car at ridiculous speeds. Um, so you, I guarantee you there are things that don't show up in the numbers that you're getting for your $214,000. That's X factor there for you. Yeah. Right. Having said that, this is a mid-priced car in the league that we are right. voting on because we're going to get to a Ferrari that is very easily, I imagine, going to be in the $400,000 range. We're going to do a McLaren that's similar. And really the only car that can compare to the Corvette uh, in terms of price is the NSX. And I forget, you know, I know it's in the six figure range, but I think it's low six figures, like in the hundred thousand or so. You know what, after doing this one and after what you just said, Rob, like I know that we were all kind of just like, maybe not disappointed with the last episode, but we were just like surprised. Um, I'm stoked now because it's 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 basically proving uh, what we set out to prove. Um, I kind of mm -hmm. like it. Yeah, I, I think everything you said was totally on point. And um, yeah. but at what point? See, what I'm trying to get at is okay. If this is a medium performing car within this group, right? right. It's not the extreme high end, and it's not the low end in terms of performance. And the price is right in the middle as well. Right. It's not as cheap as the Corvette or the NSX will it's pretty be. close to the Corvette when you compare it to the other two or the other. Yeah. I mean, the other two are just going to be astronomical. So this is kind of my point is it's kind of a different, difficult thing to judge. Does a Ferrari, which gives you 800 horsepower and skid pad numbers that will blow your mind apart and a sub 10 second quarter mile, is that worth $400,000? Oh, no one said this was going to be easy. I'm, I know this it's is... not easy, but I'm, I'm questioning <laughs> I'm, I'm questioning if I would go as low as you did with a two, Vinny. I mean, or what did you say, two, five? No, he said two. No, yeah. I said two, but damn it, you're, but you're see, making that's me question it too. I was, I was with Vinny at first. I know. And then see, like my knee -jerk reaction was like, oh, $200,000, this thing's like way overpriced. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think I, I'm not, I'm not giving it a three. There's no way in hell it's getting a three. Um, I can get close to a three. No, I'll see, go, well. At the end I of the day, let me to... let me make my argument before you yeah, guys. Yeah, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. just just because I want to. I'm I'm kind of on the opposite end. The amount gained over the Corvette is not proportional to the price increase. That's and still factually that, true. I still but, believe but, that. Yeah. But so I but can't, Greg, I can't that's in that. terms of pure performance. Remember what I said about refinement and. No, I got you, and 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 yeah. I'm saying that price warrants something. Mm -hmm. I don't think that price, I think it's, if this car was 160 grand, I think I'd be looking at it differently. This getting into that two level, even if it was 199.99, mm -hmm. right? Something to consider too, Greg, before you finish that thought is that you can do that. You Why can not get the same exact quadrant. performance. It's the way we optioned it. Yeah. No, well, we sure. took a huge jump when we opted for the four-wheel drive. As but that's the thing. The I would oh, not buy this car yeah. without Quattro. Yeah, right? okay. No way Never I would mind. buy this car. So right. Strike that. Strike that from there. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to split the difference between you two. I'm going to be 2.5 because it's a, it's, yes, it's not 400 grand. But it's also not 400 grand worth of car. I don't know that it's 215 grand worth of car. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm still at two, man, because um, as much as what you said made sense, Rob, I'm still like looking at it and we, I have to measure them and, and compare them, all of them to the Corvette. And mm -hmm. it's just so far below where all the others are going to be. It's, mm -hmm. it's still a two. And maybe that means that the Ferrari is going to be a, like a 0.3. I don't know, but 
I got, I got to stick with. Well, two. you got to see uh, either you or Greg just made an interesting point that, you know, for $400,000 is a ridiculous amount of money, but, but what you get in terms of pure performance with that Ferrari for that money, it might very well make you think, you know what, if I had just millions of dollars to burn and I wanted something that just cooks asphalt, maybe $400,000 is not outrageous for one of the best performing cars on the planet. Clearly, the R8 is not in that category. And I'm weighing it like, yeah, $215,000 is a lot of money for a car that it might have you know, light years in terms of refinement over a Corvette. It, it does not have light years over the Corvette in terms of performance. It just doesn't. We've, we've established some of the metrics. It's a matter of tense. So weighing that out, I'm going to go 2.75. Uh, well said uh, well said yeah yeah um, i mean because like as i'm thinking about the the ferrari and i can't do anything you know yet but i mean i think if it gets a three three and a half from me that's gonna absolutely crush the five from the corvette yeah you know oh yeah I mean? yeah because it's it's just like rob said you know if it's a 1.5 million or whatever but you get like astronomical performance out of it then yeah the value is better than this car that we're doing right now mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this was a tough one and I'm glad we did it early because this, yeah. I, this is probably going to be the most difficult one to do right after yeah. the Corvette. And you know what, buddy, we're going to have a hard time with the NSX as well. Cause you know, the NSX is I, not, I don't think I will. I think I'm going to be a little more favorable towards the NSX. Greg, are you, are, 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 is that one that you're going to have to brush up on? Like, as far as like, uh, cause it's totally different than all the other cars that we're building. Um, or do you, uh, go, do you know quite a bit about that power plant? I mean, I wrote an article on it, so I'm a little familiar with it, a little more familiar than probably, you know, passing. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a I fan. Just, I'm, I'm, I'm curious what role that's going to play in. in it's, well, it's not going to be right detrimental. I will tell you that. And, and look, guys, this is the only car that we're going to be reviewing that has four wheel drive. Think about that for a second. That's pretty cool. Well, yeah. that's perfect for what we're going into next, yeah, which is X Factor. Surprisingly, right. though, you know, it, I, I was expecting a lot better handling out of it, right? Because it was going to be all, four wheel drive. All wheel drive, you know, the four wheel drive, all wheel drive, that doesn't surpass the laws of physics and let's throw a caveat in there we don't know for a fact that the skid pad numbers and nurberg ring numbers that we just reviewed for the r8 were in fact for the quattro version they could very well have been for the this real world true. drive version this is um true. you know there's so many variables here let's not fret over you know quarters of points and stuff yeah. clearly this car is not the bargain performance car that a Corvette is and it's not the world beater in terms of performance that a Ferrari or a McLaren is going to be so 275 that's that's yeah. kind of perfect is well, from where well, I'm looking at it yeah and and what you're saying we're going into x factor now yeah is why I want to give it a higher x factor score because I do feel like we're being a little harsh deservedly so on it but it does have some redeeming qualities Mm -hmm. the quattro all-wheel drive system that's mm -hmm. a redeeming quality the i know you guys said you know you don't Vinny, you don't like the spartan teutonic you know aesthetic interior i kind of do i kind of like that the car is a driver's car it's aimed at the driver um some it's just i i still think the ra it's like you know i may not agree with the ra being you know Two hundred and fifteen thousand dollars doesn't mean I don't like it. Like yeah. I still think it's a very cool car. Hey, look! If you handed me to the key, the keys to one, I would certainly not turn you yeah. down. As to whether I would actually gravitate towards this car in a real world situation where I had this much money to burn, mm -hmm. I just kind of feel like there's a lot of other cars out there that would turn me on more. A, a car that we're not even reviewing, Greg, like a, an Aston Martin Vantage, man, I would want one of those a lot more than an R8. I mean, uh, let's be 100% honest. 
if you gave me a half million dollar car budget and said you get one car, I'm probably looking at the Ford GT. Yeah, for me, it would be a Ferrari, but I this wouldn't be anywhere car. near any of my lists. What's you that? Know, this this car isn't anywhere near any of my lists, right? Like if you gave me that same budget that Greg is talking about, I, this is not even an afterthought. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's why you don't see a lot of these. I mean, I see them every once in a while, but compared to the number of Ferraris, McLarens, uh, Corvettes that I see, this is a, this is a rare bird. And but that does, that figure, add to, does that add to your X value? I, that's a good uh, question. Well, uh, collect uh, what? What's our category? Yeah, well, X factor. We're an X factor. X factor. So it's, it's just for your me, wild card. For me, there's two X factors on this car. Number one, it's the only four wheel drive uh, mm -hmm. car that we're reviewing. Although it's not reflecting hugely in skid pad numbers and stuff. Like I just said, we don't know for sure that those numbers reflect. The, the all wheel drive version of the R8. Um, you know, Audi is renowned for having the finest four wheel drive systems in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and the other X factor is, dude, there aren't a lot of V10s out there and it's a sexy configuration. You know, I've only been in one V12 in my life. My neighbor, Alex has a, has a V12 Ferrari that he's taken me rides in and there is as much as being americans and loving muscle cars the three of us love the sound and feel of a v8 a multi-cylinder engine like a v10 a v12 takes it a notch higher it does trust yeah. me there is something just awesome about your running a v10 Yep. So, you know, those are, those are bonuses to me and we're, we're not going to see them in any other car that we build. The other cars are all going to be, are all V8s. This is the only multi-displacement, multi-cylinder uh, car. Well, so. and then I'm, I'm, you know, if you want to get into the, the exclusivity, because I know that's been something we've kind of judged on before. Um, I will say. There is a YouTube channel that is building an R8, or they might have finished it by now. Mm. And his normal stuff is Honda stuff. Does yeah. that add to or take away from its exclusivity? Nah, that's it was cool. affordable. It's affordable enough for some Honda guys. And I'm not trying to put him down because he also built one of the most gorgeous, you know, Mark IV Supers I've ever seen. But mm -hmm. it, I don't know. It's it's exclusive in that I. I can say, honestly, in the year 2021, I have not seen one in person. Um, in terms of exclusivity, I'll, I'll, I'll default, on one hand, I'll default to the argument I've been using in the past where this is not a limited edition car. Yeah, It's not like they're making a thousand of them and get your order in now or you'll never have one. If you want an R8, go down to your Audi dealer, fill out a, an order form, you, you know, four five months later, you'll have your R8. So it, it's not exclusive in that respect. Where it is exclusive is you don't see them on the road all the time. And if you are driving, driving an R8, it draws attention to you. And if that's your thing, if you like being noticed, there is a pronounced a, a more exclusive aspect to this car than the Corvette. Okay. I that's where I kind of disagree with you, Rob. Um, so the X factor, yeah, like you said, the main one for me is the all wheel drive, uh, you know, that you can't discount that it's cool. It's just cool. Um, but for me, it's like Audi took this platform, mid engine car, all wheel drive, you know, they gave it all these like amazing attributes, right? The performance reflects a, a really stellar car. And then when you look at it from the outside, it's like, okay, it's got great lines. It's, you know, it's, it's, um, but it's functional, right? It's functional first. So, you know, it follows that adage, you know, a form over or a function over form. Um, and so because of that, to me, it, it, they took all that and they somehow ended up making a boring car. It, when we compare it to the other cars in the same arena, I to do, me, I, it's kind of like, see what you're saying. It's the most lackluster out of all of them. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the Ferrari, you know, exquisite. Um, it's just so gorgeous. And then you look at uh, the, the Corvette and it's, you know, all for the money. It's amazing. 
And then the NSX, it's like, oh, that's kind of exotic. You know, it's like got this weird kind of power plant. And then, you know, the McLaren, I, I forget which one we're going to do. I don't, I'm not. I, I don't, I haven't established yet because they got so many different models. It's, it's hard. Uh, I'm going to really have to do some research on the but McLaren. The, 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 the McLaren has interesting styling. It looks a little bit different than all the other ones. Mm -hmm. And then we get to the Audi and it's just kind of like, yeah, it's a, it's a great car, but it doesn't well, do anything for me. Yeah. And it, it actually, though, you know, you mentioned form following function that that's a very Germanic um, thing. They don't put frilly, you know, back in the 70s when the 911 Turbo first came out and they put that huge, massive whale tail on the back that's so iconic. And people were shocked that Porsche did that because Porsche was already known as no frills. You know, if it doesn't add to performance, it ain't going on the car. And they stupefied everybody who looked at it at first and said, wow, that looks insane and ridiculous. It added a couple hundred pounds of downforce to the rear of a car that wanted to kill you every single time you drove it. Because it's rear engine, it had snap oversteer on it that literally killed lots of people who weren't good enough drivers. And they reduced the number of 911 turbo fatalities with that wing. It was actually form over, you know, it was function relating to form. And I think the R8 is kind of similar in that respect. There, there's no big, like stunning body on this car like a Ferrari has because Italians are all about um oh, it's <laughs> German. And if you want to send your complaints, you can send them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you want to label me a racist, do so at Rob Finkelman. <laughs> but the point is, these are cultural things, and yes, right. I'm making generalizations, but Italians love aesthetics no I, I, germans germans find beauty in function right okay this is an extremely functional car and it does so dispensing with a a lot of flair it's not a flair car it's yeah it's not surprising to me that this is what they turned out right like yeah. if you went to all those respective brands and you said make me the coolest car that you can and this it's is indicative of this is what they would make. So yeah, it's not surprising. Exactly. Um, yeah. uh, it's just, it doesn't do it for me. And that's, right. since this is X factor, I have to give my opinion. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to score it very high. It does have some very cool things about it, but I just, it doesn't, you know, tickle my fancy. So yeah. what, what, uh, what's your number? Um, I don't know. You guys haven't given yours yet. Uh, I'm, I'm going to put it right pretty much in the middle. I'll give it a little more than a median uh, number. I'm going to give it a three because it is the only uh, four wheel drive car and because it's the only V10. Um, this thing must howl like, you know, a mad dog at, at, at high RPMs. Don't forget this sucker goes up to 8,700 RPMs. Can you imagine what a V10 pulling that you know, on a freeway late at night, what that must sound like with the yeah. windows down. Um, it, you know, I, I'm with you, Vinny, like out of all the cars we're building in this segment, this might be the one I would probably buy last. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, if the, y'all know how I feel about Ferraris and that, that would obviously when we get to it, it's going to be my number one. Uh, pick if I had the money, where would I go? Yeah, that yes. Ferrari's in my garage. I might go for a Corvette before this car because you're getting a 100%. lot more for your money. Yeah, yeah, you know? I, absolutely. I'm there. I'm there with you, but for yeah. the same reasons that you gave it a three, I'm giving it a four because yeah, the, the V10 the, and the all-wheel drive, it's cool. Yeah, but there, there's one small problem, and hmm. one reason I'm giving it a four. I have this ingrained feeling for some reason like we're being too hard on it 
I can't tell you why, because nothing we've said that's is unfair. because they, they made an awesome car. It's yeah, just nothing kinda... we've said is unfair. But I feel like by giving it that extra point, I'm somehow absolving. I'm giving I'm putting my do- dollar in the Salvation Army bucket at Christmas. And I'm the best human in the world. Right. <laughs> no, I'm, think... giving the... <laughs> I'm being charitable. To, yeah. to this. And, and, and you know what? I think you've hit on something and that maybe you're very right in 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 saying, because you know, to reiterate, we haven't test driven any of these cars. And uh, if you go and look at the reviews of this, of the R8 Quattro, um, you know, the platitudes that magazines like Car and Drive or Motor Trend gave this car, it was like, they were saying things like it's the ultimate in refinement. It's, you know, it's so practical in terms of its driver vehicle interface. Like you can feel every single aspect of the pavement through the steering. They gave it platitudes like that, not this thing accelerated so fast that like my underwear was in the back seat. They reserved that for a lot of other cars, you know, Ferraris, Lambos and stuff. But with this car, I can remember when it came out, it was always like, this is the height of German engineering. And I, I, I think you're probably right that maybe we've been a little harsh, but only because we haven't given, been given the chance to, to drive it. Well, you know? there's that, but I think, I think I, I have a, a point that's going to really drive it home. And that's that. If you were to put this side by side with the actual equivalent Lamborghini, which car would you rather own? Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's a no brainer. All of us are going to gravitate towards the Lamborghini because which car is more popular. This, it has the same drivetrain. I, I honestly but, don't know that I'm going to make that call. Really? That is, Have you seen a I'm Lamborghini saying, yeah. Huracan? Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I don't, I'm not a Lambo I, fan, but I, I don't know if I'm making that call. You really? Put them side by, I don't know. I'm not, I don't know. Okay. The, well, the, when I, I say, I do like the car, I do like what this is. My like, argument is still the same. When I say yeah. you, I mean the general yeah. popular because the Lamborghini is so much more popular than this car and they're exactly oh, the same. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's because it gives you a lot of the refinement of this car, but then wraps a sexy ass body on it. And, you know, who doesn't like a sexy girl who's also smart? Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean it, it translated to a woman. Would you rather, you know, have yeah, of an OK looking girl that that, you know, is real smart and successful and whatever? Or do you would you gravitate? more towards a woman with all those qualities and she's a bombshell you know yeah. hey we're men <laughs> you know we're only wow, men. Right. uh uh um you're gonna pick on the italians and be misogynistic in the same yeah. episode yeah i'm gonna hit every <laughs> well, see, single that would be the perfect segue in the looks except that Vinny still hasn't given us his x-factor number yeah I, yeah so um i think it's right in the middle for me it's two and a half uh, I can't give it, you know, one way or the other. Um, it's got some really cool things about it, but it's just, it's kind of uh, milk toast. Okay. So now, now we go into looks. I mean, and my X factor was like almost directly tied to looks, and that's um, fine but, because it's an yeah. X factor, and it's yeah. what it's for. So I mean, um, I, what did I, I give I the? Uh, what did I give the Corvette for looks? Yeah, you were the stingiest at three point seven five. I'd go. Uh, I mean, this isn't a bad-looking car by any means, and when you see them in 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 person, they're they're striking-looking. You know, they're very low. Yeah, uh, they're very wide. Um, they don't look like anything else on the road. Like when you when you're cruising on the highway and there's one in the lane next to you, you look over and you're like, even if you don't know what it is. Like if you're not versed in cars, you look over and the average person would say, okay, that's something really expensive. I don't, is, I don't know what it is, but you know, that's an expensive hypercar or supercar. So I, I think, uh, I think I don't like the styling quite as much as the Corvette. Um, but I don't hate this car by any means. So I'll just give it a tick under the Corvette. 
um, and I'll give it a 3.5. And it'll probably be my lowest number in terms of aesthetics out of the cars we built. Okay. There are things that I really like about the um, aesthetics of this car. I like all the carbon that we put on it. I thought that was really cool. Mm -hmm. um, I liked the graphite wheels. Uh, I like that, um, you know, you can get them in silver or that graphite color. And, uh, and, and I like that because it's not black, like you said, Rob. Uh, it's not, they're not black wheels, but they're dark. Right. Um, and then I like the really like wi wide mouth grill, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, the, sh the overall shape of the car is nice. Uh, even though it's kind of like uh, it would get l like lost in a in a sea of other cars kind of like it if that makes any sense like like if you if you were to tell like a a video game designer to like you know create a, a performance car it might just kind of look like that it's a generic a performance car look like it like it could be in gta yeah exactly yeah um it's actually you know what's interesting it's not like utterly dissimilar looking when you see it in person from a Godzilla. It, yeah. It's like a Godzilla has that same feel where it doesn't have those Ferrari lines. It, well, it's, yeah, but the I would, I would get into GTR a whole has, different argument about that. Yeah. The GTR, I think the GTR beats this. 100%. Um, especially in because terms of, of uh, aesthetics. Yeah. There are yeah. some flares on the GTR that are really cool. Like those circular taillights um you know what i mean like the long sweeping headlights so i think it's a little bit different but the the shape of the car is similar um the the audi is just uh you know it it's we forgettable for milk me. toast before yeah. milk toast is a very specific has a very specific meaning like it's yep. not ugly it's yeah. not gorgeous it's it's milk toast it's right there you know? it's forgettable for me you know it's yeah. it's something that I, i'm not gonna write home about so yeah i give it like a um what i i probably gave the the corvette like a four or something there you go. yeah um i'd probably give this thing a, a three it's a it's a nice looking car but it's just you know meh. well i think you hit the nail on the head i mean don't get me wrong i like the way the car looks i do but it looks like it was designed in a wind tunnel with zero emotion just like we've been talking about this entire time. Mm -hmm. Nothing, no single part about this car makes my breath speed up. Doesn't make my heart race. Right. Uh, looking at the, at the Corvette, like there were lines that were just literally taking your breath away. It's just, that looks good. I see what they did that. That looks, I mean, here I see so much Audi TT in it. Mm -hmm. And I feel yeah. like this should differentiate itself. That roof line is totally Audi TT. Yeah. Um, yeah. There, there's just, nothing ridiculous about this car, whereas yeah. there are things on a Ferrari that are just absurd. That, How'd that you do it earlier, it. Rob? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that just make it like so unique and special. I mean, I'm, I'm going to say something that is probably going to get me some emails. Uh oh, I, be inflammatory, Greg. Do it. This is the Honda Civic of, of hypercars. Mm, I don't. And when think I say Honda offensive. Civic. And when I say that, I'm talking about the the like the the EK, you know, era. So like you know, 90, 92 to ninety eight or whatever, right? You mean like an um, actual shape, like the way it looks. No, or no, no. I'm saying person? just in general, it's it does what it needs to do for its segment. It touches all the right, you know, it, it checks all the right boxes, but at the end of the day, it's nothing hyper special. Yeah. Like it is nothing that would. You wouldn't, the looks alone are not going to get me to spend more money than something else. Mm -hmm. um, so where, so where are you at? Yeah, what's your number? <sighs> I mean, Vinny gave it a three. We gave, we, I mean, everybody but Rob gave the Corvette a four. I, I think three is deserved. I really do. I mean, if anything, I might even go a little lower because uh, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. It's a little I, nicer than right in the middle, I think. Yeah, yeah I, but I feel like a hypercar is supposed to yank your heart out of your chest with the aesthetics. Well, but this is not yeah, a hypercar. This is, Remember, this is a supercar. But, this a, a, also, yeah. but guys, yeah. this is all, you know, that's a loaded statement because Italians have taught us what we thought a hypercar should be because Italians previous to the past, like, 20 or so years were really the only manufacturers of 
of G whiz, you know, insane looking. And it starts back with like the Lamborghini Countach, like yes. in the seventies, which just was absurd looking. Germans don't do that. It's not in their culture. You know, it, it really is. A, I hate to offend again, but, and it's a generalization, but Germans find beauty in superior engineering, not in aesthetics. No, and, and, and um, for sure. But I mean, like, look, look at its sister. Or sibling. I don't want to say scissor. It's sibling. The the Huracan, right? Right. The Huracan isn't necessarily my style, but God, look at the lines. Like the lines yeah. are beautiful. It's not my style. Yeah, but it's but set it, on wheels. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's it's sharp. It's a and I don't mean angular. I mean it's a sharp looking car. Yeah. Um. So, the I, I feel like What's your number, dude. I'm gonna give it a three because <laughs> I can't bear to give it any less. But I feel like maybe it's a 2.7, but I'm going to give it a three. I'm not going to go right. that low, but Fair I enough. feel like, I feel I like. I think if you give it anything less than a three, that is offensive. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I think so too. I mean, it's not an ugly car. No, and not at when all. When you see them in person, like I said, yeah. you know, this is in a very expensive toy. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, but I just feel like they didn't do what they were supposed to. What's the, the uh, what's the next category? That's it. That, that's our... Oh, look, we end on looks. Okay. Yeah, we end on looks. So we end up being... Well, that's the thing. I'm worried about giving it too low a score and I give it the highest score overall. So... Really? Okay. Yeah. I was at 25, well, 25. Uh, Rob was number two at 25. And Vinny, you didn't like it at all at a 23. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, we're, we're in the same ballpark. We haven't... Uh, I think the only car that we've deviated on greatly was really the Challenger Red Eye because Greg hammered it. Um, <laughs> I love it. And, you know, Vinny was somewhere in the middle. But, you know, we're all with Hammond. What's the spread? Like, four I mean, the, the spread them? literally is, is 2.25 points. Extreme. That's nothing, man. No, it's not. We're probably closer on this than any other one. Maybe the GT500. I'll have to mm -hmm. go back and look at that one. Yeah. Yeah. We all agreed that thing was sick. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but now we get into the, cause it auto calculated. I don't have to struggle doing math. Uh, the dollar per point is over three times that of the Corvette. Yeah. In a, in a bad way, meaning you're not getting the value out of the car. Well, Correct. again, this, yeah. this might not be this, th that might be such a disparity that dollar per point kind of, like maybe we needed to move to a 10 point system, whatever. It just shows that I think these numbers will compare to everything but the Corvette because you're not going to beat the Corvette in these numbers. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what this tells me. You're not beating the Corvette. Mm -hmm. What'll be interesting to me when we get to the two most expensive cars, which is going to be the McLaren and the Ferrari, does the hyper performance that those cars offer offset our feelings of like, my God, that's a lot of money. You know, with, with this car, it's stuck in the middle because well, it's like, it's not, um, it's not a ridiculous performance jump over the Corvette yet. It's a ridiculous price jump. Well, but when I, you get into the Ferrari, you are getting a ridiculous performance bump in addition to a huge price jump. Well, yeah. I, will, I will say if our super muscle car comparison is anything, I think an elevated price can withstand. That's my the, point. Because, very because well the GT500 won, even though it was yeah. brutally exactly. more expensive. Yeah. So, well, exactly. yeah, I, I, I think win. the Ferrari could beat the. Could I, beat the I, I don't think it could. I think just, just from a sheer number standpoint, I don't, because the price is going. No to one's going to watch up. now because you, because you. No, said. that's not true. <laughs> No, no, I'm saying I just think I that that off, final dollar per point. I'm saying like anybody offline, that can look at it offline, offline, we can plug fives across the board into one of the other cars, and we'll see if you're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, but but then again, that dollar per point isn't the end all be all. No, I think I think it's more of a of a relative value than an absolute value. Um. Because at the end of the day, if our you opinions have, are law, Greg. Yeah, because well, I mean, at, at the end of the day, if you have a half million dollars to spend on a car, are you really going to go buy the Corvette because it's a better value? 
No. No. <laughs> no. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. I don't know. But I, I'm just saying, I think I think the Corvette may be a curve buster. You know, we'll have to wait and see. We got three other cars to build, boys. Yeah. But and exactly. I think they're gonna I think they're gonna compete against each other very well. Fair enough. Well, everybody at home is gonna have to tune in next week to find out which car we build next. Um, could it be the Ferrari? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. We're gonna have to see. But, I think uh, we might have to spin the wheel of destiny for the yeah. remaining remaining three. I think we might have to wait until the Corvette and Ferrari showdown to be at the very end, but who knows? Could be. Yeah. Well, by the time we get to, I mean, realistically, when when is the Z06 supposed to be out? I don't know. It's there's been so much talk of it for a while, like at least a year. They've been talking about it. I'm wondering if it might be out in time to be us to circle back without there being a huge gap. Maybe. I mean, the 22s start getting launched uh, when next month, September. Yeah, yeah, but the, yeah. it was the the Z06 is a 23 model, right? Mm, are we already on 22s for Corvette? Yeah, because they they canceled the rest of their 2021 production. And just started oh, that's, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So so it'll be called the 23, but yeah, it'll be God knows 22. when it'll actually come out. Yeah. But, yeah. So. But that would be cool if we could we could circle it would. back and. It would. Gentlemen, this was an interesting episode. I was yeah. not expecting uh, to go the way that it did. Um, Again, I'm glad that it did because uh, I think it it's it's hammering that point home that the Corvette is pretty awesome for how much money. Yeah. Um, I, I think this was a perfect, and it wasn't intentional, but I think this was the perfect one to do right after the Corvette. Yeah. Well, Rob, thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, as always, we appreciate your time and uh, look sure. forward to having you on. Great. I uh, again, I always enjoy myself, and I'll uh, I'll be seeing you guys next week. Cool. I know we've been going for a little while, so we'll let you go, but uh, we'll see you next time. Hi, I'm Jim McElvain from Optima Batteries, and I'm here today to talk about why batteries aren't made like they used to be. You've heard people say that, and it's true. Batteries aren't made like they used to be made. They're made better than ever, but people are still having battery problems. So why is that? because new vehicles are more demanding than ever on their batteries. I came out here in a Chevrolet Silverado that had air-conditioned seats, it had satellite radio, it had Wi-Fi, it had OnStar, it had all kinds of stuff. And you need strong batteries to power all that. So the batteries they're putting in vehicles today are sometimes 30% bigger than the batteries they put in 10, 15, 20 years ago. So what can you do to extend and maximize the performance of your battery regardless of the brand? Use a battery charger or maintainer. Use it once a month. This is the Optima Digital 400 charger and maintainer. Anybody can use it. It's no spark technology, so you won't hurt yourself using it. Positive on positive, negative on the ground. That's it, it'll do the rest. Take care of your battery, it'll take care of you and your vehicle. Well, there you have it, Greg. Uh, man, what a, that was a fun episode, dude. We. Uh... I think I'm I'm a little really, bit of soul searching like it was a little I liked it because it reminded me why we started doing this right like the C8 is the underdog right but it's not necessarily like we're we originally started talking about value mm -hmm. and I think this episode more than possibly all the others that we're gonna we're gonna do has proved our point that like yeah the, the C8 while it might come in last as far as like performance metrics are concerned it might be by a small margin and at a fraction of the cost yeah and i mean i was really surprised being all introspective about the the looks of the car because i mean i always thought r8s were you know good looking cars but yeah it, i mean i don't think it holds a candle to the to the c8 so no, and of course that's subjective, right? So like yeah. Rob said, um, you know, if you talk to someone who's of uh, European tastes, um, you know, they might have a totally, you know, they might look at uh, a, a C8 and be like, oh my God, the thing's gaudy and ostentatious, right? Um, and that's fine. You know, that's what makes the world go around. But uh, yeah, I, I liked the, uh, the history that Rob gave us in the beginning about Audi as a brand. You know me, I'm not, I'm not really like a, a Euro um uh, auto enthusiast so that was all news to me i thought it was really cool especially about the whole silver 
uh, color, how it goes back to racing. And I thought that was cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> Audi is such an interesting company, right? Like you, I don't want to say they're forgettable, but I mean, unless you're a European car enthusiast, it's not something that's at the forefront of your mind. Usually. It's not exactly, you know, Renault or Alfa Romeo, but it is a little bit obscure, you yeah. know, but then again, we live in the United States and, you know, our jobs revolve around, uh, you know, domestic auto manufacturers and what they're yeah. doing. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt, I think. Yeah. I just, I mean, I like Audi. I think they, especially their, their rallying history because they literally did, they, they changed the game there. And I've always been a huge world rally championship fan. Um, so I don't know the first thing about it. I just, it's fun to watch, you know, like when I see it on like ESPN 8, the Ocho. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, when, when it would get preempted for uh, dodgeball. Yeah. 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 Um, but uh, no, it's, it's exciting to watch and the crashes and like all that stuff. It's gnarly. Um, but that is one thing that I did know about Audi, right? Like, so I totally uninitiated as far as uh, European manufacturers are concerned. But one thing I did know about Audi is that they're known for being, all wheel drive, right? Like the Quattro technology is like, that's their thing. So, yeah. Yeah. It's and it's, I mean, it's Quattro has been just, just a dominant force. I mean, it literally proved that you could put it into a car, right? Yeah. I mean, dude, I, um, I was telling you not too long ago, I was, uh, out on a, um, closed course driving, uh, <laughs> Snake Eyes, that's my 72 Monte Carlo after uh, we had installed the supercharger, new MSD Atomic EFI, and uh, I was just kind of shaking some of the cobwebs off, seeing seeing what's going on. Um, and a brand new Audi, uh, I'm not sure what model, but it had a V8, and it was all-wheel drive. Um, apparently, they had access to that same closed course, and, uh, and man, they gave me a run for my money. And we're talking about this Monte Carlo that, granted, it's a heavy car, makes um you know 400 and some odd horsepower to the wheels and this audi was you know not it, it was we were neck and neck i was very impressed with that car i was like holy we both pulled up to the end of the the road there and i think we both had the same reaction like wow that is a fast car i was not <laughs> expecting that <laughs> both kind of looking at each other like what, what was that what just happened <laughs> Yeah, so no, I, I they're cool. I like the fact that you know it had a V8. I asked, I thought it was like a turbo six, and I asked him, and he said, No, it's a V8. I was like, Oh, well, that explains it. Yeah, yeah so I, I think, I mean, kind of like what I said at the beginning of this about the C8, I think the R8 is there's nothing wrong with it, it's just when compared, maybe it's not the most value oriented or uh, i don't know i mean we'll, we'll see how it stacks up and how it's it shakes for, out but it's for a particular buyer which is clear because you know you don't see them too often right uh, yeah. whereas uh you know i mean I, I feel like you have to wear a suit when you're driving the r8 you know like you're you have a certain type of person owns that car and you know it's it's kind of like a it's kind of like um a supercar that you can take to a really fancy business luncheon and like not be embarrassed. Cause it's like a purple Lamborghini. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not, it's not, it doesn't have anime wrapped yeah. on the side of it. And yeah, <laughs> no, I, I get you. And I mean, I think I, I hate to say it. I think that's where the Lamborghini has gone. I mean, yeah. they've, I, like I was saying, I do kind of think the, the styling may be a little more attractive, even though it's not for me on the Lamborghini than the R8, but I think the Lamborghini has picked up a persona, at least in the US. Yeah, it looks like um, a it looks like an anime character itself. Like it's gonna transform it, into it, something. Yeah. You know? I mean it's it's kind of turned into like the YouTuber flex car, right? Yeah, for sure. So but yeah. on that, you know, on that same token, if I were uh, you know, a hedge fund analyst or I was a stockbroker or something and you know, I, I needed to go to those meetings, but I wanted something that was um, akin to one of these cars. It wouldn't be the R8 uh, and it probably wouldn't be the Ferrari and it wouldn't be any of these cars. I'd probably get an Aston because I think they're they're gorgeous. They have beautiful classic lines and it's like all business. But at the same time, 
it's a killer looking car. So yeah, I and I mean, and remember, I mean, a good chunk of these own oh, these cars owners in our intended owners will never have them on a racetrack. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, let's be honest. Um, a lot of that is bragging rights. A lot of that is so foreign to them. I mean, you could tell them that it had a zero to 60. Well, no, because zero to 60, they can actually test. You could tell them it had a, a six minute, you know, 12 second Nürburgring time. And for most people that would own one, they would never know the difference because yeah. they're never going to take it to the Nürburgring. They're never going to probably take to an autocross or a road course or anything to really know how it, how it handles you know, like that. So point. that's a good point, man. Um, you know, one thing that, uh, I don't think we can discount either is that like Rob was saying, the, the refinement of this particular car, right. Or Audi in general is of, uh, the highest caliber. Um, I, I don't know, never owned one, never driven one, but I think that's something, you know, important. Uh, and that's another thing that we're maybe not considering, um, because, I just want to go fast, man. <laughs> well, every every Audi I've been in, and keep in mind they're all lower end, you know, older. I mean, uh, comparing them to my S550, I know that American cars have made a you know huge leap, and we're talking at this point probably ten year old, you know, Audis, lower end Audis. Right. I'd say the those at least are pretty com- you know comparable. Right. I I don't I haven't been in anything new new on the Audi side, but if it's better than it was 10 years ago, it's pretty impressive, you know? Right. Well, viewers, listeners at home, weigh in in the comment section below for us, please. Let us know, are we way off base? Um, Is the Audi not, is the Audi R8 not boring at all? Is it an awesome car? Is it your favorite car? Let us know. Um, Do you hate it? Tell us that too. Uh, Let us know what car you want us to build next. We have a few. um, I'm not sure how we're going to decide which one comes next, but uh, we would love your input. As always, hit that like, comment, and subscribe button. Ring the notification bell. Do all that jazz. I also want to take a quick moment to thank all of our sponsors. That's Performance Distributors, Pro Charger, ARP, Liquid Molly, Silver Sport Transmissions, Holly Performance Brands, Optima, Performance Online, and of course, our title sponsor, Lucas Oil. Without them, this show wouldn't be possible. And without you guys, the show wouldn't be possible. We need you guys to tune in every week, and we really appreciate those who do. Greg, before we uh, let them go, do you have anything further for the people? No, I think I think we're pretty good this week. We're already, uh, uh, we're already uh, quite, quite long. <laughs> well, hey, you know, um, the people want to know our thoughts on these cars. Uh, we are authorities. And um, <laughs> speak for yourself, dude. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we have a good time. We hope you guys do too. We'll see you next week, noon Pacific time, as always.